Okay, good morning again. <laughs> so I uh, said that we are going to start today with a discussion of deflagration and detonations, which is a simple way uh, to look at possible waves, uh, <coughs> combustible waves, <coughs> that um, uh, are solutions of the equations, the general equations that we derived yesterday. And, uh, but the focus will, uh, from here on, will be on deflagrations or flames. And uh, so we'll start with some general discussion before we move on to uh, specific problems. Uh, so the, um, so the idea is to try to look at uh, one-dimensional solutions uh, in which uh, the mixture, for example, uh, the combustible mixture is uh, far on the left, uh, and the initial properties are known, uh, pressure, density, temperature, the concentration of the reactant, and the mixture is at rest, is quiescent. And uh, then uh, there is a, a region where all the uh, diffusion, heat conduction, uh, chemical reaction, viscous effects are all important, namely where uh, all the activity happen. Uh, and uh, this whole uh, structure is moving to the left or is propagating to the left to consume the uh, reactant at some velocity V0. And uh, it leaves behind uh, some uh, gas, some burn product, uh, with different properties, P infinity, rho infinity, T infinity, the concentration of the species YI infinity, uh, and a velocity which is not necessarily, uh, uh, of course, uh, zero. In other words, they move on. And so it depends if you look at the velocity in the uh, of the particle, which is uh, U infinity, which will be the difference between V infinity and V naught, uh, which is I refer to as the fluid particle. Uh, and uh, as I said, the wave is moving at a velocity V naught to the left. Uh, the interest uh, in the problem is to identify two things. One, what's the velocity that the wave is propagating, namely to determine V naught, and of course to determine the conditions uh, uh, in the burn product. So those are the two main questions or the objective of this. Of course, it's easier to <laughs> describe the problem in a frame of reference which is uh, moving with a flame. In other words, if you are an observer moving uh, with a flame, then uh, the flame will be stationary. I say the flame, but I mean the combustion region. And then uh, the region will be stationary uh, in some region here, uh, the uh, observer will see a, uh, a gas coming at exactly the velocity V naught to hold this stationary and leaving at a velocity V infinity. Uh, so in this frame, uh, the problem is steady, so we don't have to worry about time-dependent variation. The, uh, it's easy to uh, show how you transfer from one to the other simply by doing a transformation uh, relative with the wave velocity uh, uh, being the, the difference. So uh, this is uh, essentially the flow we would like to examine. Uh, what I put on top is just a copy of what you have seen yesterday, which is again all the equations uh, in the somewhat general form than we have uh, seen it, in other words, uh, equivalent, but in one form that I will use in the subsequent. Uh, again, mass, momentum, species, energy, and all the other uh, constitutive relations that are needed to fill in all those parameters, which uh, all the variables which are here. Uh, so if we write or if we take this equation and write uh, the steady version of them in one dimensional form, uh, this becomes just d by dx of rho v equal to zero. Uh, the second one, uh, if you write it in a conservative form, then the rho go inside, so it becomes uh, the derivative of rho v square 
and uh, uh, then the rest is equivalent. Uh, sigma here uh, becomes, uh, or, or the divergence of sigma, which is d by dx of uh, the s sigma become 4 third mu dv dx coming one from here and, well, well, it's a combination of those. Uh, and then uh, uh, you get the, the energy equation, uh, which is from here. Q here is the heat flux, one dimensional, so uh, the vector notation is out. Uh, the dissipation function, uh, viscous dissipation is this guy. And the uh, uh, yi, or the equation for yi, again in conservative form, uh, is written here, and the equation of state was added. I didn't, it was up here. So, uh, so this is the general equation. I wrote here that we will use for simplicity a one-step overall reaction. It's not really important for this discussion. You can do it for uh, any number of species that you want, but uh, the, there is some discussion that need to be done if you have uh, a, a whole reaction scheme, particularly when, uh, when you talk about the species equation. So I will just simplify the discussion, uh, avoiding to do that. Uh, now, the equations uh, were not, as you see, uh, written as a full derivative of the variable, but uh, by manipulating a little bit the uh, momentum and energy equation, this can be done. For example, you see the, uh, the, the continuity equation is written derivative of uh, rho v, which is a mass flux. Uh, so we can write all the other equation the same way, uh, as you see here, d by dx of a quantity here, which contain the pressure uh, and, and the, the, the momentum and so on. And the same thing with the, with, uh, the energy equation. So it requires a little bit of manipulating the equation to do that. Uh, and it, by the way, it cannot be done in three dimension in general. So this is uh, just for the, sim the simplified one dimensional version. Uh, the only exception is the species equation because of the uh, reaction term here, which obviously cannot be written as derivative of. Uh, so the next step is to integrate this equation from the far left to the far right, in other words, from negative infinity to plus infinity. And uh, so what you get is rho v is a constant. What's in this uh, bracket is a constant. The same thing for all those three. And so what you have is uh, <laughs> these three relations, which uh, when you evaluate on the left and you ev evaluate on the right, you get uh, uh, the three relation. Rho v naught is rho infinity v infinity. Uh, from this relation, you get just the p and rho v square. Uh, the reason is because you expect that far to the left, far to the right, the, the mixture go or the, the, the flow uh, become uniform to a certain, uh, tend to a certain value, and so all derivatives are going to go to zero. Uh, all derivatives, meaning also uh, uh, the, the diffusion velocity, meaning also Q, which depend on derivative of the temperature and the, uh, and the diffusion velocity. And so uh, that will come in the next one. And so uh, these are known as the rankine nigoni relation, but we are going to try to simplify a little bit more in order to discuss their properties. Okay, so what about the equation for the species? Uh, again, if you evaluate it, you don't need to integrate, or you can integrate if you want, but you evaluate it from negative infinity to plus infinity. Uh, this term drop because uh, dyi dx, again, goes to zero. Uh, this, term, this term drop, again, because both uh, yi and vi, the derivative of, uh, goes to zero. Uh, which imply that omega i has to go to zero on the left and omega i has to go to zero on the right. In other words, uh, the rate of consumption of the species far to the left uh, should be zero and far to the right should be zero. Now, far to the right be zero, it's, it's easy to understand because uh, eventually when all the reactant is consumed, uh, the mixture will go to some equilibrium. 
and therefore uh, there would be no more uh, reaction proceeding. But uh, far to the left, uh, it's a bit problematic because uh, the reactants exist and the rate depend on the concentration and on the temperature. And in principle, the reaction will start uh, uh, evolving. And so it will never really go zero. It's a, a situation which is referred in the literature as the cold boundary, called uh, clearly because it's on the left, uh, cold boundary difficulty. We are going to encounter that difficulty again when we talk about the uh, planar flame, and so I will discuss it a little bit more at that time. But essentially, the difficulty uh, arises because, um, if you like, two things. One, the infinite domain, and uh, two, the nature of the Arrhenius uh, reaction rate. Um, so the next, so we are going to, uh, the, the idea is to proceed under the understanding that even though omega i does not vanish identically at negative infinity, it's very small and therefore negligible. But of course, it's not going to affect the other relations, so uh, it's not, uh, at the moment, it's not crucial. So from these three relations, which I recopied here, <laughs> we want to start simplify the last one. So uh, we know what the enthalpy, uh, the difference in the enthalpy is uh, equal to the difference in the kinetic energy. Uh, uh, but uh, before uh, doing this, uh, before substituting for, uh, the, uh, in other words, the difference in kinetic energy, we want to write as the difference in enthalpy, which can be simplified uh, using the fact that uh, you know, H can be written as the uh, enthalpy of formation plus the sensible enthalpy. Sensible is the integral of Cp dt. But since we are assuming here that all the Cp are, uh, are constant, then the integral gives you simply Cpt, and you evaluate it at infinity, you evaluate it at zero, you get the difference. Uh, the first term we have uh, discussed yesterday briefly that if essentially is the difference between the enthalpy uh, of the reactant and that of the product, which is the heat release Q. And uh, the second one, as I said, is a sensible enthalpy, which is the difference uh, of the enthalpy uh, of the burn minus the unburned gas. So when we substitute it here, uh, you get uh, uh, these two terms coming uh, uh, to replace the change in enthalpy. And then uh, the temperature can be replaced by P over rho using the equation of state with the appropriate constant in front. So uh, with this, uh, we end up with the, uh, the two uh, relation. From the momentum equation, you get the difference in pressure divided by the difference in the reciprocal of the density, or if you like, the reciprocal of the density is the same thing as the specific volume. Uh, so, so this divide by that is equal to minus uh, 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 m square, where m is, I didn't define it, oh, it's here. It's rho naught v naught uh, square. So that comes from this relation. So m is essentially the mass flux into the combustible region. And uh, uh, this is the first relation, which is known as the Rayleigh line. You see why line in a minute. The second relation comes from uh, the one that we derived here, but I, uh, we, it's written as the, uh, in terms of the pressure equal to what's on the right-hand side. And the right-hand side is essentially the kinetic energy, which from this relation is replaced by that. Okay? So there is some manipulation that you do, and you replace those two relations uh, uh, the, the three relation into these two. Actually, it's three because m equal to rho, rho naught v naught is a, it's a third one. So this one is known as a, the Hugonio, and what's specific about the Hugonio is that it's only a relation between thermodynamic variable, unlike the first one that depends on the velocity here, which is m, right? Uh, so if uh, you know v naught, in other words, if you know the 
propagation velocity of that wave. Uh, it is straightforward then from this relation to compute the final product. So knowing the final product can follow this relation. But of course, uh, the propagation speed is an important unknown that need to be determined. So it, to discuss the Rayleigh line and the Hugonio, it's easier to discuss it in dimensionless form. And uh, the way that uh, things are made dimensionless is to define the ratio of the pressure uh, at the far right divided by at the far left, uh, similarly for all these variables. And then uh, mu will be here the mass flux, no confusion with viscosity because it's out of this discussion of today. And uh, the little q is the heat release parameter, again the dimensionless re heat release parameter, uh, which again no confusion with the heat flux because it's out of the question. Uh, so, uh, if we rewrite the equation that we had uh, in the previous slide uh, in dimensionless form, this is the Rayleigh line, P minus 1, V minus 1 equal to minus mu, and this is the second relation, which is the Hugonio. Uh, note that uh, when P is 1, V is 1, uh, then, uh, well, if you write this as p minus 1 equal to minus mu v minus 1, in other words, you, you multiply by v minus 1, you get when p is 1, v is 1, the equation is satisfied, which is clearly uh, the value uh, far upstream. And uh, in fact, it's the same, uh, well, this is the same true, but it depends, there is no heat release, of course. Well, anyway, the point here is that these two relations de determine P and V for a given mu. It's the same statement I made before. If you know V naught, you can compute the final uh, product, and here the final product are P and V. The initial, uh, uh, the initial state is one and one. Okay, and uh, if uh, we focus on P and V, V, by the way, is the velocity, but also V, in this case, is the specific volume. It's the same thing, <laughs> because V is equal to 1 over rho. And so uh, rho is 1 over V. Can be, uh, you can, after knowing P and V, you know rho. You can compute T if you are interested. And uh, to find the solution of these two equations, all you need is that to find the intersection, where they both intersect. It's two algebraic relations. Okay, so the, what did I do something wrong? Oh, uh, I wanted to make one comment before uh, I uh, look for the intersection and possible solution, is that in the dimensionless uh, uh, variable or the way that I have made the equation dimensionless, uh, the value uh, mu, the equation for mu, uh, can be, uh, which is by definition m square over p naught rho naught, can be also written using the relation above as gamma, the ratio of specific heat times m naught square, m naught being the, the ratio of v naught over a naught, namely the Mach number, the velocity relative to the speed of sound. So mu essentially is gamma m naught square, so in fact the mu is like the velocity or the upstream Mach number, okay, in dimensionless form. Uh, but mu can also, uh, instead of multiplying and dividing uh, uh, the equation, as you see from here, by rho, rho, and then substituting from the above relation, I can multiply by rho infinity, uh, uh, or I can uh, express m as rho infinity v infinity, and then multiply by the appropriate uh, ratios to construct the following relation, gamma p over v m infinity square. So mu can be also expressed this way, where m infinity is the Mach number of the burn gas. The reason for uh, uh, just showing you this is to show you that there is a relation uh, between the two, which I may use in the future uh, in evaluating uh, different properties uh, uh, across the wave. So uh, back uh, to what we want to discuss, we want to again look at these uh, two equations, the Rayleigh line and the Hugonia, and look at the possible intersection uh, that uh, are possible. So 
we have to graph them one at a time, and we are going to graph them in the uh, in the in in the plane of pressure versus uh, v versus uh, specific volume or velocity. Uh, oh, the first one that I plotted actually is the Hugonio. Uh, the next one we will see the Rayleigh line. So the Hugonio, it's this expression that you had before with a little, uh, uh, if I denote this gamma plus one over gamma minus one with a capital gamma, it's easy to rewrite it in this way, uh, which show that uh, essentially uh, the Hugonio, it's a, a rectangular hyperbola. Uh, it's a hyperbola that tend to this uh, asymptote, which is the capital gamma, uh, when uh, when uh, p goes to infinity, and to this asymptote, which is minus gamma, when v goes to infinity. Okay. Of course, this asymptote is irrelevant because it goes below the line uh, zero. It's not physically of interest, but this one is of uh, of importance or of interest. Uh, and anyway, what it suggests is that the solutions of these uh, the, the, that we are looking for, since they have to be positive, they will be limited uh, from p can go from zero to all the way to infinity, but v is limited to these two values. Well, it's a straightforward from those two asymptotes. Another comment to make here is that when q equal to zero, when q equal to zero, then uh, the, uh, the hyperbola go through the point one one. In other words, one one is a, uh, a point on the hyperbola. Whereas uh, you can uh, easily see it from actually the original relation here, when q equal to zero, the numerator and the denominator when v is one is, is the same, one one. But uh, when q is not zero, then the hyperbola is shifted uh, uh, upward, okay? So Q equal to zero corresponds to no combustion, a wave with no combustion or no reaction occurring. So this is the Egonio. The next thing is the Rayleigh line. The Rayleigh line, I didn't write it here, but if you remember, it was uh, P minus one over V minus one equal to minus mu. In other words, the slope is negative. If the slope is negative, then it means that uh, from this point it will go this way or this way, but it cannot go in the positive direction. So that eliminate all this region. This region is not possible, and this region is not possible to find solutions. So solution should be only in this uh, uh, region here or in this region, a region here that we refer based on the physical property as detonation, and the region here where we denote, we refer to based again on the physical property as deflagrations. Uh, if we uh, start with Q equal to zero, just to make uh, a comment, I said that Q equal to zero, the curve go through the initial state, one, one, that's the Hugonio. So here are the two possible uh, uh, slopes, as uh, of two possible Rayleigh line with a, uh, with a negative slope one that will intersect at this point here on this, on this region, and one that will intersect uh, this region at this point. Those are the only two uh, geometrically possible solution of these two equations. Now, uh, uh, this uh, is known as a shock wave across which uh, the pressure increases, increases tremendously from here to here, and uh, the density uh, well, the velocity decreases, so the density increase. And uh, uh, this is known as a shock wave. The other one, the other possible solution, uh, which uh, should be uh, a, a, well, this one is a compression wave, so this one should be a rarefaction wave. It's a compression wave because, as we said, the density increases. The other one, density decreases, so it's a rarefaction wave. But it turns out that it's not physically possible. It was shown actually quite early on uh, by Rayleigh in the 1910 and Taylor in the same time that uh, the reason that this point is not a possible solution is that the entropy doesn't satisfy the second law of thermodynamics. 
risks. And so, uh, and so based on that, it violates the second law. Entropy increases, and so it's not a possible solution. Uh, it's a very interesting comment to make here uh, about the fact that I'm talking about theory and the importance of theory. Uh, in 1910, when Rayleigh and uh, Taylor uh, uh, proved that uh, this solution is not possible, there was no discussion and there was no knowledge and nothing was done about supersonic flight or supersonic uh, flow. This was not a main discussion in, in, in the aerodynamics or in the fluid mechanics community. Nevertheless, they uh, came to that conclusion and make a statement which turned out to be very important later on when uh, supersonic combustion became, a uh, supersonic uh, flow became eventually an you know, important uh, uh, study and uh, supersonic flight became very important. The, the message here is that sometimes some basic research, some understanding of basic uh, uh, properties of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the fluid mechanics or the combustion properties, even if you don't see the immediate uh, uh, implication or the immediate application of it, being fundamental is very important because it can be used or applied later on or it can be useful later on. Anyway, um, uh, this is the, as I said, the only possible solution in uh, when Q is equal to zero and so, but it's not uh, primarily of our interest. We are interested in uh, uh, Q not equal to zero. So for Q not equal to zero, the, uh, this is the initial state, but note that uh, I draw here the Hugonio away from that point. In other words, it does not include the initial point. And therefore, uh, any straight line with a negative slope can intersect the Hugonio twice uh, at a lower end point and an upper end point here. Uh, since this region we have referred to, and we will discuss it as detonation, this is referred to as a weak, and this is referred to as a strong detonation. Similarly, you can have two possible solutions uh, on, that intersect the, the, the Hugonio uh, again with a negative slope to in this uh, lower region. And uh, this is referred to as a weak deflagration and as a strong uh, deflagration. So in fact, for positive uh, Q, in other words, when you have heat release, and by the way, the analysis is also true if you have a, uh, uh, not heat released necessarily by combustion, by added heat to uh, a compressible gas. So it, it's the same. The discussion is the same. Uh, you end up with essentially four solutions, okay? And so we need to discuss those uh, possible solutions. So uh, first we focus on the uh, detonation uh, side or the one that intersect on the left. And uh, this is the reason why uh, they are referred to as detonation, uh, because on passing through the wave, uh, the pressure increases, the density increases, so the gas is compressed, and the velocity uh, uh, decreases, so it slowed down, right? It's based on just looking at uh, where the solutions are. Now, another comment to make is that uh, this uh, Rayleigh line uh, uh, there is a minimum value of mu, of a slope, and the solution can only have uh, uh, a slope or a velocity larger than that minimum. So solution only exists when mu is bigger than this critical value. This critical value is that when the Rayleigh line is exactly tangent to, to the Hugonio, and the solution at that point is known as chapman juguet after Chapman and Juguet, who discussed it and uh, uh, discovered it uh, early on in the, uh, I think, late 1800. As any slope uh, smaller than that will not intersect the Gonio, and so there is no possible such solution. So there is a, a minimum uh, value of mu for detonation, and all the solution behave that way. What about deflagration? For deflagration, there is a maximum value of mu. So all the 
uh, solution has to have mu less than mu Chapman Jouguet. The slope has to be less to intersect. And on passing through a deflagration, the pressure decreases, right? The pressure decreases. The density decreases, so the gas expands. And uh, the velocity increases, the gas speed up. Okay? So these are, in fact, the two different physical uh, picture or behavior that distinguish between the solution on the left and the solution on the right. Uh, the, uh, now, uh, the chapman juguet solution that I have indicated here and in the previous slide, uh, it's easy to find uh, ev everything that we are interested in. We stated that the objective of the, the analysis is to determine the wave speed and to determine the final properties uh, uh, of the product. Uh, for the chapman juguet it's very easy. Why? Because there is one additional condition on top of those that we wrote before, which is the tangency line. In other words, the Hugonio and the Rayleigh line uh, has to have the same tangent at that point. right? And so if you add the tangency line, which is the derivative of the the PDV of the Rayleigh line or the PDV of the Hugonio, you, you compute the derivative, which is written here, and you, um, and, and you combine those two relations. You get one more relation in addition to the one that I wrote before, which imply that mu is equal to gamma P over V. Now, remember I mentioned earlier that mu can be written in terms of the upstream Mach number or in terms of the downstream Mach number. This was the relation in terms of the downstream Mach number. So when you equate this to this, it's, it means that the Mach number of the, uh, uh, of the burn gas uh, is equal to 1. Or for chapman juguet waves, the downstream gas velocity relative to the wave is sonic, or the Mach number is one, okay? So that's uh, one important conclusion. Uh, by uh, looking at the slopes of the lines, uh, remember there is a, a minimum and a maximum mu for uh, each uh, of the two, one can also determine that all strong detonation and weak deflagration uh, have to, the downstream gas velocity is also less than the speed of sound, which means that it's a subsonic, whereas for weak detonation and strong deflagration, the downstream gas velocity is supersonic. So those are, again, determined just by looking at the, uh, at the picture relative to the uh, chapman jouguet uh, One, uh, for the chapman jouguet one can also uh, evaluate, as I said, everything. One, one additional relation that I have shown you earlier is that mu essentially is related to the upstream Mach number. So if we, again, put all the relation that we have together, we can get an, an equation or a solution for uh, the, the upstream Mach number. And uh, the equation turned out to be a quadratic, and so you can, in, you can evaluate or you can write the two solutions. You see a plus and a minus here, the two possible solutions of the quadratic. The plus correspond to the uh, detonation, the minus for deflagration. And so what you see is that uh, uh, for detonation, uh, the upstream Mach number is greater than 1 or deflagration is less than one. In other words, detonation propagates supersonically, deflagration propagates subsonically, okay? Uh, that's, uh, again, an immediate result from here. And uh, you can also evaluate the velocity or specific volume, the pressure, and then the temperature. I mentioned to you how you compute all those. Since you know the uh, Propagation speed, you, all these are, they follow one from the other. Again, there are always two solutions with a plus and a minus. The upper one is the detonation, the lower one is the deflagration, and uh, uh, we know everything about those Chapman Juguet waves. Uh, another uh, thing to uh, point out or to, to notice about the difference between detonation and deflagration. 
uh, if we look at the, uh, at the, at the, sol at the solution that we have, uh, uh, or, or the possible solution that we have determined, uh, in a laboratory frame, in other words, when the wave is moving to the left at the velocity v naught, and the gas is uh, a quiescent here, and it's moving at some speed here, uh, then uh, what we, we see is that uh, for detonation, since uh, V infinity is less than V naught, remember the solution was to the left of the initial state, so V infinity is less than V naught, then U is negative. What does, it, what does U negative mean? It means that the fluid particle move at the velocity which is in this direction. And so uh, here is a Tx, in other words, a position versus time, uh, and uh, uh, of, of, let's say, a fluid particle uh, at uh, this time at t equal to zero is at rest, so u equal to zero. It remains at rest until the wave, until it, the wave approach it or come to it, right? The wave is propagating. So the fluid particle here is at rest until the wave reaches it. When it reaches it, that fluid particle is moving with u negative, so it follows the wave. So what, is in, what happened in detonation? The flow follows the detonation wave. It cannot catch it up because remember, uh, it, V infinity is less than V naught and V naught is, uh, uh, is the, well, since V infinity is less than A infinity, in other words, since it's, we determined that it's subsonic uh, behind the wave. Uh, in contrast, uh, if you look at a deflagration, V infinity is bigger than V naught, so U is positive. So the fluid particle is sitting here until uh, the wave reaches it, and then it moves uh, at a velocity positive, which moves away from the wave. So in deflagration, the gas expands and moves away from uh, the propagating flame. Flame propagates to the left, the gas expands, move to the right. Uh, so here I listed uh, essentially the difference between deflagration and detonation. Uh, deflagration are expansion waves, uh, propagate subsonically. Detonation are compression waves, propagate supersonically. The burn gas uh, for deflagration expand uh, and accelerate away from the front. Uh, in detonation, the, burn, the wave retards the burn gas and compresses behind the, the, the front. Uh, then the, um, uh, the chapman jugay wave propagate uh, 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 at the speed of sound, weak deflagration uh, subsonic. Uh, uh, the burn gas is less than, uh, well, it's, uh, the, for the burn gas is M infinity is less than one, and for strong deflagration bigger than one, and uh, the equivalent thing for uh, detonation that we discussed earlier. Now, uh, this is uh, a point that I did not point out before, uh, or maybe a point that I want to make. I think it's coming also in one of the next slides. Uh, uh, okay, so we found solutions that satisfy the condition far upstream and far downstream. But are these really solutions of the differential equation that describe conservation of mass, momentum, and energy? Well, the answer is, only if we can show that the differential equation can connect the solution of the left to the solution on the right, okay? So this is what we refer to as the structure. In other words, we have to show that the, there is a structure that connects those two uh, states. The fact that the two states are possible solution is not by itself a proof that those would exist. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is, and, and by the way, in dynamical systems, this is uh, usually referred to as a trajectory between two equilibrium points. In other words, if you have two equilibrium points, which in this case is the unburned and burned gas, you have to show that there is a trajectory that connects them. In other words, that the solution can uh, uh, move from one to the other. Uh, the other point to make is that uh, the solution that you obtain had to be stable. In other words, if there is some small disturbances, then uh, it will, if the solution gets uh, taken away from uh, uh, the, the, the initial uh, 
state, then the solution is unstable and it cannot uh, uh, exist. Unstable solution don't exist physically because in reality there is always disturbances in any system unless you take extremely uh, careful precaution to avoid them. But we will talk about stability later. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, the first point is the main point that I want to make here. So it was, uh, it can be shown, uh, not straightforward, it's a complicated thing, but can be shown that uh, the uh, wave structure, in other words, there is no way to connect the, uh, the left to the right point for a strong deflagration. And so the way, uh, and so strong deflagration are, for, are, are not possible, or uh, the consideration of the wave structure forbids strong deflagration. Uh, for a detonation, in principle, both detonation weak and strong are possible, but weak detonation are seldom observed and uh, they will not fall into the category of, or in the form of the uh, uh, more uh, familiar or more uh, acceptable form of uh, uh, detonation, which is known as the ZND, which I will say a few words about it later. So weak detonation are seldom observed. Uh, now, for deflagration, there is a unique solution uh, for the weak deflagration, since only weak deflagration exists. There is a unique solution that connects the unburned to the burned uh, uh, gas, and uh, this uh, solution uh, uh, will be for a given, for an obtained V naught, V naught is the propagation speed, which is known as the flame speed. So there is a unique solution uh, that to give a definitive wave speed, which is the flame speed. For a strong detonation, it can be produced by driving a piston at an appropriate speed into the mixture, and so the propagation speed depend on the, how, it's over, how is the detonation being driven. I'm not going to discuss much about detonation, as I said, but I just wanted to make that point. And then uh, the only self-sustained detonation, in other words, that propagate without being uh, forced by the piston, is a uh, chapman jugate So the chapman jugate detonation are the uh, self-sustained detonation. Uh, and uh, uh, at the time, Chapman and Juguet each uh, uh, provided the argument why uh, the chapman juguet wave is the one uh, uh, to be observed. Uh, but uh, today you can also get uh, uh, a strong detonation uh, produced by driving a piston, so their argument is not uh, uh, final. It's, anyway, it's... Uh, it's it's, uh, it was up for discussions. Uh, also, their argument was based on things which were not necessarily, uh, uh, I wouldn't say correct, but necessarily imply that, uh, that only Chapman, only those waves are uh, in existence. But anyway, uh, another point, just to general point to make, is that weak deflagration uh, travel at uh, a low speed, typically between, say, 10 to 100 centimeter per second, in other words, at the most a meter per second, more or less. Uh, the pressure is uh, very, uh, change in pressure is very small. Remember that the Higonio, uh, the Higonio went this way, and so the changes from the initial state to the, uh, uh, to, to the final state, the changes on the Higonio were quite small, so the pressure doesn't change very much. Uh, temperature ratio and density, and since the pressure doesn't change very much, the density and temperature are reciprocal of each other, and uh, they are typically of, uh, the, the burn temperature is about six to 10 times at the most, the initial temperature and the density is the reciprocal of that. See, this is rho naught over rho infinity. Uh, in uh, uh, the detonation, I just put here the example of a Chapman Jugave in hydrogen air, for example, where you have velocities which are uh, like uh, extremely uh, large, 2,000, 3,000 meters per second. The pressure difference is huge compared to deflagration. Uh, temperature and uh, 
variation density as shown here. So uh, this is the main difference between the two. I made here a few comments, uh, but some of them I already discussed. This one say that the rankine uigon analysis provides the state of the burn gas, but does not determine the wave speed, except for the chapman jouguet wave, where we have an extra uh, condition that allow us to determine them. Uh, the existence of a final state based on analysis does not guarantee the physical existence of the solution. And I said there are two things that you have to still show, that a structure exists and that the solution is stable. And uh, the next one is that uh, because detonation wave velocity is faster than the speed of sound, the material in front of the wave is not affected by the detonation which passes through it. But uh, deflagration on subsonic waves and disturbances behind the wave can propagate ahead and affect the state of the unburned gas before the arrival of the, uh, of the wave. Uh, of course, it depends on the boundary condition, if, uh, the, the, if it's done in an open, say, tube, closed tube, and so on. Some of these we will uh, discuss specifically uh, uh, later, probably tomorrow. The expansion of the products can therefore be, can cause a displacement of the reactant so that the wave moves faster than the flame speed. So then in that case, the deflagration sometimes can move faster than uh, the laminar flame speed. Uh, uh, essentially, uh, the difference between these two or these two comments, uh, the main difference is, uh, I would say it uh, in mathematical terms, uh, the, 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 the detonations are essentially hyperbolic equation, uh, and so upstream conditions are not affecting the solution, whereas uh, uh, deflagration are elliptic equations, and so the solution at a certain point depend on upstream as well as downstream condition. That's basically the, 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 the equivalent to what I said here. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, because uh, uh, of uh, various things like intrinsic instability, turbulence, obstacle, a deflagration wave can be made to accelerate faster and faster, and at some, at some point perhaps turn to a detonation, a process which is known as DDT, or deflagration to detonation transition. Again, a subject that it's not, I will not discuss, it's still a subject of very much uh, uh, interest in research. I know little about it, and I will not say much about it. So um, uh, before I uh, move on to only flames and, uh, and deflagrations, I want to just say a few words about detonation, and in particular the so-called ZND structure. So Z stands for Zeldovich, N for von Neumann, and uh, D for During. Uh, at about the same time, they came up with the, the following idea that this is uh, the structure or this is what a detonation will uh, look like. Uh, now, uh, note that I have reversed the direction, and now the, uh, the, the detonation is moving to the right, not to the left. Uh, the D is the speed of the detonation that's common in the, liter the detonation literature. So if you have a particle here, uh, uh, the detonation, the front of the detonation is a shock, it's a shock wave, so there is a lead shock, and that compresses the fluid particle in some region which is uh, quite small, narrow, and is known as an induction zone. And uh, then uh, you have a reaction zone where most of the reaction occurs. Sometimes it's referred to in the literature as the fire. And uh, there uh, the gas in, it's like a deflagration behind the shock. And so the gas expand and so you see the particle enlarge. So uh, across the shock wave, you have an increase in pressure, increase in density, increase in temperature. And then uh, in the induction zone, there's a small change uh, in temperature, pressure, density. But then uh, essentially you have here a deflagration or a flame where the temperature increases, the pressure decreases. We have seen that this is the nature of deflagration, and so is the density. So um, uh, 
Uh, well, this is maybe a description of what I said in a little more uh, detail. So essentially, the idea is that you have a shock followed by a fast uh, deflagration. And um, uh, here I can uh, uh, just uh, visualize uh, in the Rankin-Ugonio plots uh, what I just said. Uh, I just want to make one comment first. Uh, so remember that uh, the initial state, by the way, I put it here because we are interested only in the detonation, which is on the left side of the, uh, of the initial state. So the initial state is V naught here, P naught, okay? The green point here. Uh, lambda uh, correspond to the progress variable, which is equivalent to the, uh, to the heat release. So Q equal to zero correspond to lambda equal to zero. And uh, then uh, as the more heat uh, is, uh, well, as the reaction progress, lambda vary. And lambda equal to one correspond to the Q uh, being the heat release of the, 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 the combustion process. So uh, for different lambda, you're going to have different hugonio, which uh, you can think of them as a partial of the Q, right? And so they will be uh, in between the hugonio that correspond to lambda equal to zero and the one corresponding to lambda equal to one. Now, uh, since uh, the solution uh, should be the intersection of the a hugonio with the heat release Q, which is lambda equal to one, which is when the reaction is complete, uh, with the Rayleigh line, the, so there may be a solution here, which is the weak, and here is strong, okay? Those are the two possible solutions. We're gonna focus on the strong to begin with, uh, and, and then the chapman juge is here. So I draw this line just to, to, to indicate one, not, I didn't wanna put too many lines on the same graph. So uh, when lambda equal to zero, there is no, there is no combustion. There is still the initial state. So th this curve here, the first one, uh, correspond to a, essentially a pure shock, shock wave. We said that the, the ZND start with a pure shock, so the solution should follow, in fact, this curve. And follow up to a certain point, which is known as the von Neumann point, which uh, depend really on uh, the way that the uh, detonation is being overdriven or is being driven. And then uh, from that point, uh, this is a pure shock. So this is a lead shock that I show you in the previous picture. Behind that, you will have some uh, induction zone and then reaction. So the reaction starts slowly. So if the reaction starts slowly, you should move from this point to a different hugonio with a lambda being a small number after zero up to lambda equal to one. So it will follow essentially different hugonio up to the final state, which is in this case, it's a strong detonation. So this is essentially the structure for a strong detonation. Similarly, uh, if you wanna follow the one that will uh, get you to the chapman juguet which is the self-sustained detonation, is going to be uh, up to this point and down here, okay? Um, uh, you can see from this construction that it's not possible uh, to go through a shock to a weak detonation, so that's why weak detonation is slightly different, uh, have a slightly different, uh, uh, should have a slightly different discussion, and as I said before, it's seldom observed, so it's, uh, it's not uh, uh, within the ZND uh, discussion. Okay, um, and uh, maybe a final comment about this is, uh, about detonation, is that uh, uh, even though that structure, the ZND I described, uh, more hand-waving, if you like, uh, we can write the equation and, and dis discuss all those properties that I said. Uh, but um, uh, the, the wave is uh, very unstable, and so it's not, it's, it's not observed as a planar wave, unlike uh, flames, which you can observe them more or less as planar solution. 
uh, and they tend to uh, either uh, um, uh, be a spinning detonations or detonation in tubes with round cross section are observed to propagate like in a helical path, okay? So they don't propagate uh, as a planar front. Uh, or uh, in, uh, sometimes in, uh, you will observe a cellular structure that uh, as you observed here. And uh, one, of course, in that topic, one can discuss what's the intersection point and, uh, uh, you know, lots of detail about this, but that will be out of my uh, discussion. I want to move on to deflagration, and that's the main topic uh, of the rest of the lectures of this week. And uh, I will uh, start with, uh, go back to remind you the equations that we have uh, uh, put forth uh, yesterday. So uh, here are the equation in um, that essentially we derived the, the continuity equation. Uh, I want to make a few comments about them. Uh, first of all, we uh, in the second one, which is the uh, momentum equation, we are going to take uh, the that the, the the bulk viscosity kappa is equal to zero. So this will not be out of discussion. In fact, it's more or less correct for basically all combustion problems. There are some acoustic problems that, uh, that the bulk viscosity could be relevant, but then there is a question uh, uh, about uh, the pressure, if this is the thermodynamic pressure or not. So that's something that's beyond the discussion, my discussion. Uh, then I am going to assume that all the properties are constant, although uh, properties I mean viscosity, conductivity, and uh, not diffusivity, but rho times di, rho times the diffusivity, okay? Yesterday I showed you that all these three have more or less the same temperature dependence, and so if I assume them constant, I'll assume consistently that these three quantities are constant. Um, uh, sometimes, by the way, this combination is called the diff a diff it's referred to as a diffusion coefficient, but it's not doesn't have the unit centimeter square per second, which is the uh, diffusivity. Uh, uh, although I'm assuming that it's constant, there are uh, in many theoretical discussion one can allow them to be temperature dependent. It's just that the presentation will make it a little more cumbersome, so I think it's uh, for simplicity of presentation, it's easier to show them as being constant. Uh, another comment that I want to make that when you take the, this was essentially, this term was essentially the viscous uh, stress tensor, sigma, capital sigma. When mu is a constant and it's pull out, uh, this can be written as the Laplacian of V plus one third the gradient of divergence V, okay? It's just a simple manipulation. So uh, this is the form that you will see from now on, all right? And by the way, uh, for an uh, incompressible fluid for which divergence V, uh, you probably know that the Navier-Stokes equation, let's say for a liquid or for a, an incompressible flow, it's always written as mu times the Laplacian of the velocity. And uh, just one comment about the Laplacian velocity. In Cartesian coordinates, Laplacian of the velocity vector is the equivalent to the Laplacian of the components. But that is not true for other coordinate systems, so you have to be careful when you apply that um, uh, vector uh, quantity. Anyway, uh, the next uh, thing is, uh, uh, the two equations, uh, we are gonna also use the one step uh, global reaction, fuel plus oxygen go to product. Uh, so in general, you are gonna, we are gonna have only two species equation, one for the fuel, one for the oxygen. And uh, this is the two equation where when uh, these two diffusivities are, or coefficient are constant, they can be pulled outside the divergence and then they appear as a constant times the Laplacian. 
And then uh, the energy equation is written as uh, we did yesterday with the only thing is that the conductivity is again pulled outside because it's a constant and then this is the equation of state. Uh, one more assumption that we are going to make is that uh, W, the uh, average molecular weight or the molecular weight of the mixture, which in principle depend on the species uh, concentration, uh, we are going to take an average value or a constant. So essentially, this will be treated as a constant. The same thing with Cp, uh, uh, even though it depends slightly on temperature. And uh, again, so for simplicity, that will be the case. Uh, we will typically remove the gravity. Unless it's needed, we can bring it, bring it back. So these are the equations that we will focus on. And uh, the next uh, thing, uh, even though in every problem that I will discuss, I will be uh, maybe making a specific dimensional uh, uh, discussion or write them in a dimensionless form depending on the problem configuration. But I just want to make some general uh, uh, statement about the equation if we try to make them dimensionless in a certain way. Um, and uh, it makes sense to use the fresh unburned state, P0, Rho0, T0, as uh, the um, unit value for P rho T. In other words, you write the pressure is equal to uh, the, dimen uh, the dimension, less pressure is equal to dimension divided by P naught, similarly all the other quantities. Uh, a characteristic speed, we are going to choose V naught. Uh, I, again, depending on the configuration of a specific problem, this has to be chosen. So for the time being, it's going to be just some V naught to be specified. By the way, when you do a non-dimensional analysis, you always have to specify those values. You cannot leave them unspecified. You can argue that I will leave one unspecified to be determined later. But they have to be somehow uh, related to you, the properties that you are uh, to the, to the uh, configuration or the property of the problem that you are discussing. Uh, we are going to use the diffusion length, uh, the thermal diffusivity divided by V0 for distances. Uh, note it's referred to as L diffusion, if you like. Uh, the thermal diffusivity is lambda over rho Cp, so the rho here is rho naught, really. Uh, but since that's a constant, so I didn't necessarily specify that it's rho naught. Uh, and then the time will be the... Uh, lengths divided by velocity. Now, I, comment here, I commented here that uh, the choice is not unique, of course. For example, uh, I chose here the diffusion lengths as being the thermal diffusivity divided by V0, but I could have chosen any other diffusivity divided by V0. Uh, similarly, I chose uh, the, and also I chose the diffusion lengths as being my lengths, but maybe in another problem there is another length. So say it's a flame in a tube, I may choose the width of the tube as my length. So there is no unique way of choosing it. And in fact, the way that you choose it sometimes facilitate the way that you discuss the problem. Uh, another common thing that is uh, sometimes done, and uh, we will probably do it in some cases, I, I don't remember what I did in the rest of the slide, uh, is to use, instead of uh, scaling the temperature with the unburned gas, you scale it essentially with something which is related to the burned gas. R roughly speaking, uh, the heat release divided by Cp, which have units of temperature, right? And so in this case, uh, so in the former case, one correspond to the unburned state. In the latter case, one will more or less, co I say more or less because it may be not the exactly, but it would correspond to the burned state. Okay, so it depends how you scale things. Um, anyway, uh, we will not, I will not, in the next slide, I will not use, so as I said, when you define a, a, a dimensionless quantity, you write, the dimension, let's say, with a tilde, uh, the V divided by the characteristic value. Same thing for all the other variables. But uh, of course, uh, I will not keep the tilde for simplicity of uh, notation. 
So we just remove it, but we remember that these are dimensionless, and we can return to the dimensional quantities once we, are, uh, we want. Okay, so uh, if we use this uh, scaling, there is nothing uh, happen in the continuity equation because essentially there is no parameter. So there will be a rho naught divided by the, uh, the, the scale of the, temp of the time, which is the same thing as uh, the scale of this. So this equation returned to be the same. The momentum equation, uh, in front of the pressure, you're going to have a term which is 1 over gamma m squared where m is essentially v naught divided by the square root of gamma p naught over rho naught, which is the speed of sound. So essentially, this is the Mach number. And what you get here is a coefficient, which is 1 over the Mach number square. Okay. Uh, in, the, in front of the viscous term, which I already wrote that in the form that I told you earlier for a constant mu, you're going to have a parameter here, which is mu CP over lambda, which is essentially the parental number of the mixture. OK? Uh, now, uh, you may know from fluid mechanics problem that usually in front of the viscous term, you get the reciprocal of the Reynolds number. So why do I have a parental number? Well, the parental number that you get here is effectively the reciprocal of the Reynolds number, where the length is the diffusion lengths which I have used for the dimensionalization. You see, if you use a different length, then you will have a Reynolds number here, but then the equation will look differently elsewhere. Uh, the, in front of the, uh, of the gravity term, you have a parameter which is known as the fruit number, uh, which is essentially the, the ratio of the inertia divided by the uh, gravitational uh, acceleration. Okay, so this is for the momentum. Now, if you go to the species equation, uh, you don't want to, yf is already dimensionless because it's a fraction, so there is no need to make it dimension. You could, some people like to normalize it with respect to the, say, unburned value for the fuel and oxidizer, but then uh, you are going to have initially values which are 1 and uh, no, not fractions. Sometimes they confuse things, but it's a matter of choice. You can do it. Sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's not. You have to pay attention, though, what in, uh, uh, how things are uh, made. There. Now you have coefficients here, which is the Lewis number uh, of the fuel and the Lewis number of the oxide. In fact, the reciprocal of where the Lewis number is the thermal diffusivity divided by the molecular diffusivity or the mass diffusivity. Uh, I represent either F or O, so it's either fuel or oxidizer, okay? So you have two Lewis numbers here. And then you have here the ratio nu, because remember in the fuel you have nu F, W, F, and here nu O, W, O, so the ratio is the mass-weighted stoichiometric coefficient that appear in the equation for the oxidizer. Uh, of course, uh, the reaction rate uh, has to be made dimensionless. I didn't say anything about it at the moment. I will in a in few minutes. Uh, and so, in fact, now. <laughs> and so, the, uh, finally, the equation for the temperature here, the equation of the temperature in front of the PDT uh, pops out a gamma minus 1 over gamma. In front of the viscous term, okay, the viscous dissipation, you have a parental number times a Mach number square. And uh, the last term is Q, the heat release. Uh, so it's here the heat release parameter, which is the total heat release divided by the essentially enthalpy of the fresh mixture. And so this is the, the little Q here. And then, um, uh, then you have the reaction rate, which I uh, rewrote here. Um, so you, you would have the concentration of the fuel, which is rho yf divided by wf, so wf go into this coefficient, and the same thing with the yo. They are raised to some power, which I said the reaction order, the empirical number, nf, no, uh, and the sum of them is n, which is written here. And uh, the uh, activation, and the, and the Arrhenius, or the exponential term, 
minus E over RT, I call this B not, beta naught, which is activation energy parameter. Note that beta naught is the activation energy divided by the essentially initial temperature T naught, E over RT naught. Um, and finally, you have this coefficient that uh, uh, you did a dimensionless number that uh, is on the side, which is, uh, as you see on top, is the a time, which is the flow time or the diffusion time, which is the time uh, depend on that length scale LD, uh, divide by all kind of quantity, including the pre-exponential factor of the reaction uh, rate. Uh, everything at, in the denominator turn out to have also units of one over time, and uh, of time, sorry, because it's a reciprocal of B to the, uh, the reciprocal of B. And so this uh, uh, parameter known as the dam Kohler number is the ratio of the flow time to reaction time, okay? It's an important, very important parameter in combustion, and that's what uh, it is. So finally, we have the dimensionless equation, and um, I am uh, probably out of time, but uh, I, I will stretch two, three minutes more to try to finish this part. So sorry, I moved here. So we have the equation written in dimensionless form, and uh, what I want to focus is on few of these equations and uh, specifically talk about uh, the low Mach number approximation. So I'm going to start focusing on the momentum equation first, which is written here in dimensionless form. Uh, remember that this was the Mach number square. Now, uh, typically, uh, in, uh, uh, in, 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 we said that the propagation speed of deflagration is uh, at the most a meter per second. Uh, typically something like one to a hundred centimeter per second. It's much, much smaller than the speed of sound, which is about 35, 34,000 uh, centimeter per second. So the ratio is extremely small. Uh, moreover, this is the ratio square, which is really uh, very, very small. And so in this case, we can consider the limit when Mach number is very small. If the Mach number is very small, you can either look at it from here or multiply the equation Mach number, uh, and then all these terms will be uh, multiplied by a small parameter, so gradient of P is equal to zero. Gradient P equal to zero means that P does not depend neither on X nor on Y nor on Z, right? So it's spatially independent, and therefore can be written as a function of time plus the correction of the Mach number square with a p hat, okay? And uh, you can do that with all other variables, but all other variables, the leading term is more important than the next term. And so when I substitute this in the momentum equation, uh, then it's only the p hat that appear here in the gradient of p, okay? And uh, everything else remains the same. Uh, now, in the, if we go back to the energy equation, remember the energy equation, the Mach number appeared in front of the viscous dissipation term, which means that that term is small, very small and negligible in combustion. Okay, the heat release and all that uh, uh, change in energy is more important than the small friction uh, in, in gas that uh, occur due to viscosity. So uh, this is the one simplification in that equation, but there is another one um, that, uh, well, I don't want to pull back because I may mess up the slide. So uh, if you look uh, back in the energy equation, uh, the, the, there was a term dP by dt, which is the material derivative of P with respect to T. In the material derivative, it's partial dp dt plus v grad p. Since grad p is small to leading order, that term is also gone. So the only thing left is the uh, dp dt and only that p account for, okay? dp dt plus q omega. So the uh, uh, main result of the low Mach number approximation is that the uh, main or the mean or the main pressure in the field depend only on time or may depend only on time. 
and uh, and uh, uh, and therefore the in the equation of state rho t is equal to that p and that p appears in the energy equation in the momentum equation it's only the small changes in the pressure that come into play okay that does not mean that the pressure is necessarily constant or you should ignore it because those small pressure changes uh, where are they? Small pressure changes are important to, to balance the small momentum changes, okay? And so in any uh, multi-dimensional problem, this equation need to be satisfied. In one dimensional equation, usually it's ignored because then uh, this you can compute it a posteriori. Okay, now uh, uh, this in general, I left it as capital P, but uh, how does this capital P uh, define? Well, if uh, the uh, propagation is uh, not forced by any pressure uh, variation at the boundaries, uh, then uh, uh, P of T uh, will be zero, essentially, it will be constant. And since we made the dimension, uh, in dimensional form, therefore, it's going to be one. And so if it's one, this is gone, and rho T is one. And so this is essentially the equation, that's the one here that I said, this uh, basically the equation in free propagation. If propagation is in a closed vessel, then, um, then uh, th those two terms become important because the pressure, you have a pressure buildup, and in the pressure, and the pressure buildup should uh, uh, make, uh, well, it affect the, the energy equation as well as the equation of state. Uh, so if uh, it, you are in freely propagating condition, those two color term are essentially, this one is zero and this one is one. Okay, and I think uh, that's it. Uh, well, here I said in closed vessel, uh, I think there is a slide that show how do you determine this P in a closed vessel, but since I'm not going to discuss this uh, anymore uh, in this lecture, so I will leave it for you to look at uh, because of the time. In other words, uh, there is an equation from which you can obtain the global or the mean pressure changes in the vessel. I think that's the end. Oh, okay, I will take a break. I'll continue with this uh, after the break. Sorry about that. I will continue. Uh, there were only two or three slides left from the previous lecture, but I wanted at least to uh, make those comments before we proceed. And uh, in fact, I want to repeat uh, or, or just summarize again what I said about the low Mach number approximation because it's an important one in combustion. And so um, uh, typically, unless there is some uh, external boundary condition that cause a change in the uh, temporal pressure, uh, then uh, uh, this capital P, which is, if you like, the ambient, the main or the mean ambient pressure, um, uh, is, uh, nearly, is, is nearly constant in dimensionless one, in dimensionless form one, so this term uh, drop from the energy equation and the equation of state become rho t equal to one, in other words, the density is a reciprocal of the temperature. Uh, essentially, the low Mach number approximation is a result of the fact that a Mach number is extremely small, which means that uh, uh, any acoustic waves propagate infinitely fast, and so they don't affect the system or they get filtered out by this approximation. Um, only under condition where you have a closed system or you have some boundary condition that change the pressure in time that uh, these terms become important. And uh, I will not discuss uh, further this, which I uh, will skip. Uh, but the one thing uh, maybe I should re-emphasize is that sometimes um, 
there is a misunderstanding as if the pressure is constant and therefore maybe we don't have to look at the momentum equation, but this is wrong. Uh, the momentum equation gives you the small pressure changes in the flow field and in a multidimensional problem, you cannot solve the flow field without knowing those small pressure changes because the small pressure change causes small velocity changes. And so that's crucial. Okay, uh, the, there are a couple of comments that I want to make, just general. Uh, the first one is coupling function. And so this is true when the, when the Lewis number are one, and it's true not only for two species, but I mean for a global one-step reaction, but always when Lewis number is one, the operator on the left of these three equations is the same, right? It's the same operator because that would be one and one, so it's rho d by dt minus the Laplacian. And so if I uh, uh, add uh, this equation to the temperature or this equation to the temperature, after multiplying uh, uh, the, the former, say if I multiply this by Q, I'm going to have minus Q omega, and here Q omega, when I add the two, the reaction term, which is the complicated, highly nonlinear term in the equation, drops. And so you get an equation which is uh, uh, just an equation for what I refer to here as HF, or equivalent to HO, which are uh, equations that do not contain the, in other words, there is no source or sink term uh, in the uh, equation. They are often referred to as conserved scalars because they don't uh, get uh, uh, created by chemical reaction. And, uh, and it simplifies the problem because these uh, are without the reaction term in them. But this is only true when the Lewis number is one. So you can create two of those, even though the difference between those two can also make an equation for yf minus y over nu also to satisfy similar, but only two of those are linearly independent, okay? And uh, you have three equations here, which means that it reduced the problem to only one equations which have the reaction term in it, okay? But this simplification, uh, is only uh, good when the unit, when the Lewis number are one, but we shall see later that, if, in fact, small variation of Lewis number make sometimes important uh, instability or other effects that uh, are not trivial, and so using the uh, unity Lewis number is not always uh, uh, a good choice. Sometimes it's convenient, uh, and sometimes uh, it's good for getting a sense of the solution, but you have always to be aware of the assumption that you make. Uh, the second uh, comment that I want to make is sometimes what uh, is referred to as a constant density approximation. Clearly, combustion does not, the density does not remain constant, and so this is a kind of simplification used for uh, convenience in a way. Um, uh, and by the way, it was introduced early on by some, uh, uh, um, you know, people uh, in 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 uh, in flame uh, problem, depending on the objective that the problem that you are addressing. For example, the famous Burke and Schumann problem effectively use a constant density approximation without saying those words. Maybe they are not convenient words to say, but this is practically what they have used. Uh, but I just want to say what it does. Um, basically, if the density is constant, then the uh, combustion equation, which are the species and the temperature, are decoupled from the fluid mechanics equations. Okay. And um, then you have to be careful because you have to abandon the equation of state. You cannot use both rho equal to one and rho t equal to one. It's a contradiction. But more, moreover, what I want to say, and that's important uh, a comment that uh, I want to bring to your attention. I have seen in the literature, uh, people want to discuss this equation, claiming a constant density approximation, 
and they put the velocity field. Oh, this is an interesting velocity field. Let's use it in this equation. Well, this is practically wrong unless this velocity satisfy continuity and momentum. So you have to be careful. Now, if it's a one-dimensional flow, that's easy because it satisfies this equation trivially. But a more complicated flow is incorrect in principle. OK. So those are the only two comments that were left from the previous lecture. Sorry, I didn't get to them. The next one will be the premix laminar flames. And um, let's give me a few minutes here. Uh, so the uh, planar premix flame, uh, what we want is to describe uh, the, essentially the propagation. This is one of the uh, two solutions we discussed in the previous lecture, the deflagration problem. And essentially what we are interested in is the propagation speed uh, and the structure of the, uh, uh, of the uh, solution that connects the unburned to the burned gas. So the burned gas is known. It's denoted in this uh, now in this lecture as TU with a subscript U for unburned. And um, the gas uh, is at rest, so the flame is propagating uh, into a quiescent mixture. And we have seen in the previous lecture that the gas for a, de for a deflagration expand and moves away from uh, the wave. And so it will move in this direction. Uh, and far away, the properties are uniform, uh, and one of the two, fuel or oxidizer, of course, is totally consumed, and uh, so uh, either YF or YO is equal to zero. Uh, this is, for example, the, the structure that you can see that connects the unburned to the burned gas for, for a methane oxidation, looking at the uh, methane, uh, uh, ox the fuel, the oxidizer, and the product. Um, now, uh, this uh, problem, as I describe it, is intrinsically unsteady, and it's easier to look at it in a frame of reference, which is uh, an observer moving with the flame. So if an observer moving with the flame, the flame is stationary at some location here, let's say around x equal to zero, without loss of generality. And uh, the incoming gas come exactly at the uh, uh, flame speed, SL. Uh, and then uh, everything else uh, is uh, uh, the condition like before, but the flow is steady. So if the flow is steady, the equation now uh, that we addressed are the steady equation. So here are the steady equation. Again, momentum, energy, YF, YO and the reaction rate, and I left things in general, and those are exactly the conditions that I had in the previous uh, slide. Uh, everything is written now in dimensional form. I will make them dimensionless uh, uh, later on. Uh, the problem, as I said earlier, when we discussed deflagration and detonation, uh, has a difficulty, and this is known as the cold boundary difficulty, so in principle, mathematically, this problem is ill-posed. And the reason for this is that the reaction rate uh, does not vanish far to the left at negative infinity. And so this equation cannot be satisfied in that region. In terms of dynamical system, uh, uh, usually you want a trajectory that connects an equilibrium to an equilibrium, but the far the left is not an equilibrium point. Uh, and uh, so this is, as I said earlier, known as the cold boundary difficulty. And uh, the difficulty arises, uh, you can argue perhaps, because of the infinite domain, although that's very natural in this kind of study to look at infinite domain. But of course, if you look at a finite domain, in other words, when you have a burner and the, and the mixture is provided at the final location at the burner, then uh, there is no such difficulty. The, the cold boundary difficulty does not exist. But then you are not solving the intrinsic problem of the propagation uh, uh, independent of burner condition. You are looking at a more specific problem. And so that's one thing. But 
Uh, the other source of the difficulty is arise because of this uh, exponential dependence on temperature, which really does not vanish anywhere uh, uh, for infinity, even for very small temperature, unless. Uh, uh, so uh, one um, idea that was used uh, uh, in, in the past was uh, okay, let's multiply the right-hand side of the equation where the reaction term appears by a heavy side function, namely a function that values zero up to a value ti, and it's one behind ti. So that, in a way, cut the exponential to zero artificially at some point ti. Problem with that resolution is that the solution that you get depends on ti, so it's not, uh, uh, it's not a physical quantity that you want the solution to depend on. Uh, the solution that we are going to drive uh, using large activation energy, in fact, eliminate uh, that uh, difficulty only uh, arguing that uh, the exponential, as we shall see, is exponentially small and so negligible uh, in, the far, uh, uh, in the far left, namely in the unburned gas, and therefore that difficulty does not arise in uh, deriving the solution. Effectively, it's like having an ignition temperature, but without having a specific value at ignition temperature, it will depend on the adiabatic temperature, how close you are to it so that the reaction uh, occur. So um, this is just a little bit uh, of, uh, uh, of the difficulty which have ac actually have consumed a lot of work in the, I think, in 1960s or so by uh, many people, including very uh, prominent scientists that discussed the issue. Okay, so uh, uh, the first uh, uh, comment uh, that I want to make, if we look at the uh, at the equation of the temperature and the species, the fuel equation, that uh, uh, if we combine uh, these two equations, uh, note that I combine them, but I'm not assuming, as I said earlier, a unity Lewis number, and also it's not, uh, I'm not obtaining here a differential equation because this term is not the same as that term. But if I combine them, uh, to eliminate the right-hand side, and I integrate this equation from negative infinity to plus infinity. Uh, the second term goes to zero because it involves all derivatives that must tend to zero uh, at the far two ends. And uh, uh, the left equation gives you, uh, on one hand, uh, the value at negative infinity, which is known, and at uh, the other hand, at plus infinity, where yf is zero, but t is the end temperature or the adiabatic temperature. So out of this, you get that ta is tu plus uh, q over cp yf u divided by this, which is exactly the expression that we derived yesterday for the adiabatic temperature from different uh, uh, in equivalent, but different uh, in different way. So uh, the fuel, if the fuel is all consumed, that's the adiabatic temperature that you obtain uh, at, uh, in the burn gas. And uh, if uh, the oxidizer is uh, all consumed, uh, in other words, it's a rich mixture, then uh, you use T and the YO equation in an equivalent way and you get the adiabatic temperature for the rich condition. Again, equivalent to what we did yesterday. We can also derive, uh, uh, if let's say, uh, if the fuel is all consumed, there is some residual oxidizer, or vice versa, if the oxidizer is all consumed, there is residual fuel. And you can always obtain that by taking the fuel and oxidizer equation, again, combine them to eliminate the reaction term, integrate from negative infinity to plus infinity, and you get those two relations. So uh, when phi is less than one, uh, this is the residual oxidizer when uh, phi is greater than one, this is the residual fuel, and of course when phi equal to one, uh, both has to be totally consumed and that's consistent with those results. Okay, so those were some general remarks, and now back to this equation, I want to make them dimensionless. 
Uh, I will use very similar dimensionalization that I discussed in general before. In particular, uh, the temperature uh, is uh, scaled with respect to the unburned gas, the same thing with the density, uh, and uh, the velocity with the laminar flame speed or the flame speed SL, and uh, the length uh, is the thermal diffusivity, which I called here L sub F. Uh, which, uh, well, I'll comment on that later. Uh, so uh, if we uh, made the, the, as I said, it's very similar to what we had before. Uh, if T is scaled with respect to Tu, then the adiabatic temperature in dimensionless form will be Ta without the tilde. So I will add a tilde only when I want to put back dimensional quantity. Okay, so here are the equations. They should be familiar because they are identically to what I did before. The two Lewis number nu is the ratio of stoichiometric coefficient. And the most important one that I want to discuss is the damn color number, which as I said uh, before was the ratio of the uh, diffusion time to the chemical reaction time. And uh, now note that the diffusion time include this uh, uh, flame speed, before I called it V naught, now it's SL. Uh, so it's uh, uh, inversely proportional to SL squared. So the damn color number includes a quantity which is unknown, and so the damn color number is uh, uh, an unknown quantity, what we refer to as an eigenvalue. In other words, it should be determined as part of the solution. Okay, and the flame temperature in dimensionless form take this form, one plus Q, YFU if it's lean and uh, in terms of the oxidizer if it's rich. Okay, so this is the dimensionless version. And uh, the next uh, discussion that I want to do is the, uh, or find the solution using the activation energy asymptotic approach, in other words, treating the parameter beta naught as a large parameter. The ideas were heuristically discussed by Zeldovich and Frank Kamenetsky. Uh, in other words, not in a very formal way, if you like, but uh, they gave the proper idea and uh, uh, more or less the correct solution, uh, and more or less up to a factor, but that's irrelevant. Uh, formally, it was done first by Bush and Fendel in a paper published in Combustion Science and Technology, I think, I'm not sure. Uh, and um, and uh, it was uh, also later uh, uh, re-addressed uh, or rediscussed by Williams in 75. And uh, it was actually uh, uh, a time that this idea started to evolve in uh, a number of members of the community. Uh, the idea is the following. If beta naught is very large, then this is exponentially small. But uh, if that's all you do, then omega goes to zero, and then it's irrelevant. <laughs> there is no reaction. There is no combustion. So what do we do? So that's clearly not sufficient. So for this to be of interest, in other words, that you have some reaction occurring somewhere, it's not enough that B naught go to infinity. D also has to be large to somehow balance the exponential uh, in a certain region. So what we need uh, is what is typically referred to in the asymptotic literature as a distinguished limit. In other words, a limit that connects uh, two small large parameters. And the distinguished limit in this case uh, is written as uh, D will be exponential, it will be written, it has to be large, so I write, I write it as an exponential uh, in uh, beta naught, but now a positive exponential to make it large. And maybe there is a power here of beta naught, which I don't know a priori, so there is some dependence which has algebraic, uh, and remember that D is not known. That's a parameter that has to be obtained as part of the solution. So, uh, so we just write its uh, form uh, so that it can somehow counterbalance this decaying exponential. So now omega takes the following form, this D, which is a little different than the previous one. 
uh, and the, the, the exponent, the difference between beta naught over Ta minus beta naught over T, which if you do a common denominator, it looks like what you have here. So if T is less than Ta, which is the temperature ahead of the flame, right, then uh, the, this is a negative number. And so you have an exponential of a very large negative number, or practically zero. It's exponentially small in beta naught to the minus one. Uh, if t is bigger than ta, then the exponential is exponentially large. And that may suggest that uh, maybe the product yf, yo is zero. But clearly, in a premixed condition, that's not possible, because that means there is no reactant. However, that's an interesting limit that we will see in diffusion flames where it's possible to have the product zero because on one side there is no fuel, on the other side there is no oxidizer, but we will come to that later. So that's not uh, relevant in our discussion, but when T minus Ta uh, is uh, of the order of beta naught to the minus one, then uh, this is a small, this is equivalently, uh, I mean, this is beta naught, beta naught to the minus one, so the exponential is order one, and that's where the reaction is important and will occur. And so this is the basic idea of, the, of this limit, and now we have to proceed how to use it. So for large activation energy, the reaction will be confined to a thin region located where the temperature is near the adiabatic temperature. This is known as the reaction zone. And when beta goes to infinity, it shrinks to a surface that is often referred to a reaction sheet. Uh, ahead of the reaction sheet and behind the reaction sheet, the reaction is negligible. Omega is practically zero, either because T is less than Ta ahead of the flame, which is this region, which is often, as we shall see, referred to as the preheat zone, uh, or uh, it's a zero behind because one of the reactant is totally consumed and then omega is zero. So this is the uh, I, uh, main idea. Now, before I proceed, I just wanted to put some numbers to have an idea of what is that exponential does. Uh, this is taken from Westbrook and Dreyer, and I think I mentioned to you yesterday that there are, uh, 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 there are um, um, data in the literature uh, that uh, uh, gives you the reaction uh, order, if you like, but also uh, the uh, effective activation energy and pre-exponential factor if a certain reaction is described by one step. Okay, so this is uh, the result that they obtained, and they did this by uh, trying to compare uh, uh, experimental value of the laminar flame speed to computed value and to adapt to those numbers, including uh, making sure that they fall properly in the, between the flammability limit when, in other words, when that exists or not. But uh, the detail, you'll have to look at the paper. Uh, the key thing I wanted to show you is that for many of these hydrocarbon, uh, the activation energy uh, falls between 30 to 50 kilocalories per mole Kelvin. And uh, if you divide by R, then the ratio E over R is about 18,000 uh, 18, uh, Kelvin, just uh, an approximate number taken from these uh, values. By the way, uh, just something that I commented yesterday, uh, note that the reaction orders, which are denoted here by A and B, uh, are not necessarily integer, then sometimes they are even negative, okay? So because they are effective number and not uh, fundamental quantities. Okay, so if we take uh, E over R to be 18,000, oh, and I forgot the B, which is the, uh, uh, the, the pre-exponential factor here denoted by A, it's about 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 8, something like this. And so if uh, I take it uh, 10 to the 11, one of the values in that table, Tu, the unburned gas, is 300 Kelvin. Ta, about 2,000 Kelvin, say. If you compute the exponential with Tu, you get 10 to the minus 26. You see, 
If you multiply by B, it's 10 to the minus 15. And uh, if that's a typical react, uh, the reciprocal of a reaction time, you get a reaction time that will take 10 to the 15 seconds or uh, 10 to the 8 years. So it's really extremely small. Whereas if you put the A here, you get a matter of uh, fraction of second, in fact, uh, microsecond. And so uh, it's very quick, it's very fast. And so this is the uh, essence of the idea that I described before. It's the high sensitivity of the reaction uh, rate to temperature. And so the distinguished limit that we introduced before, you can uh, write it, if you like, in, a, uh, in, in dimensional form as such. You see, I, all I did here, I multiply uh, and by e to the positive exponential, e to the minus, e to the negative exponential. And I can uh, uh, think of this as being my characteristic or the reciprocal of the characteristic time. In other words, in a way, uh, this can be useful even numerically because you balance essentially, you don't get very extremely large, extremely small number in your equation. Okay, so um, uh, back to the Damkohler number. If I use uh, what I just said before as this being the reaction time, uh, what did I do here? Oh, yeah, then the D that uh, uh, I, after doing after multiplying, in other words, this d is not the original damn color number, is after multiplying and uh, the exponential by positive and negative. In other words, this would get added, and this is uh, the expression thermal d thermal divided by b tilde, b tilde correspond to all this combination here. And uh, again, it's the reciprocal of, it's related or it's proportional to the inverse of the laminar flame speed square. So D contain the unknown speed. And as I already mentioned before, it's an unknown and it's known as the burning rate eigenvalue, sorry. Okay, and so, um, now, uh, just a minor comment, because you may have heard or seen that in the literature. Uh, sometimes uh, one use, instead of the beta naught that I used up to now, an equivalent one, which is referred to as a Zeldovich number. Uh, clearly, after Zeldovich, who have introduced, in principle, uh, at least heuristically, the idea. And so the Zeldovich number is defined as ETA minus T over RTA squared. All these quantities are dimensional, okay? This is known as the damp color number, as the Zeldovich number. If you relate it to beta naught, is essentially uh, you have to uh, uh, multiply and divide by this uh, quantity. So this is my beta naught that before. And if you put in beta, it complicates the form of the upper exponential but it leads to a clean answer at the end, and so uh, it's a useful uh, notation. I must say that uh, uh, there are one, perhaps, two reasons perhaps it's convenient to use the Zeldovich number as opposed to beta naught. One is that it, typically it's around the value of 10, and so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's easy to use and think about. And the other thing, in, at least in some of the derivation of the premix flame problem, uh, it simplifies the expression. Or it's, uh, it makes the some of the algebraic expression simpler, but nothing more. Okay. In other words, there is nothing uh, specific in in that expression which is used in the derivation, which cannot be done without it. Okay. So. Uh, for simplicity of the presentation, which involve a little more mathematical detail, I will use uh, I will use uh, uh, I will use the um, a, a single uh, uh, reactant. In other words, instead of YF plus YO, just YF go to product. But I will give you the answer later for a uh, two reactant. So for a single reactant, I remove the subscript, and so this is Y. 
think of it to be the fuel, say, and it's a fuel lean condition. So uh, those are the two equations that you need to solve, and this is the omega. In principle, it's a nonlinear problem. It's a nonlinear eigenvalue problem, so we need to determine the temperature, the mass fraction y, and the eigenvalue or the burning rate eigenvalue d. Okay, so, uh, and the Lewis number in this case will be the thermal diffusivity divided by the mass diffusivity of the deficient reactant, okay? It's always important to remember the parameter, what they correspond to in order to compare probably, properly to, 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 to experiment. Uh, so um, uh, if, uh, oh, what did I do? So if we, ah, here. Okay, so uh, this is essentially the, the structure. Uh, the temperature will increase from the unburned to the adiabatic temperature. Uh, the mass fraction Y will drop from the initial value to Y equal to zero. Uh, you have a region where omega, a thin region where the reaction is important. Here you see it drop exponentially fast, here it goes to zero because y equal to zero. Uh, this is uh, known as the reaction zone. Uh, ahead of it is the preheat zone, it's the region where the temperature and most of the change occur. And uh, on this region ahead and behind, uh, the reaction is either negligible or zero. And uh, I wrote here the essentially uh, the, the scale of the reaction thickness, which is going to be on the diffusion scale divided by beta, which is much smaller than the flame thickness, the flame thickness being the preheat zone. Uh, and uh, uh, the preheat zone, uh, uh, well, this is practically what it is uh, from observation, but I must uh, make here a comment uh, remember that LF was just a characteristic length that we have chosen to scale the equation. Nobody have said uh, that this is the thickness of the flame of the preheat zone. Very often people say, oh, in the activation energy asymptotic limit, uh, LF is much smaller than in reality. But we did not say that in any of this derivation that this is the thickness of the flame. In fact, I will show you later that the true thickness of the flame is about five times this, or six times that, okay? So this is just a general comment. Now if we, uh, before we actually derive the uh, result of the uh, activation energy asymptotic for the flame speed, I uh, just want to make a general comment which is of interest. So if, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. And so uh, if I uh, look at the two equation and think of the limit, okay, and think of the limit when um, uh, the uh, reaction uh, occur at a sheet, then you have it at a sheet located arbitrarily at x equal to zero, then um, uh, the, the ahead of and behind at x equal to zero minus zero plus, uh, basically there is no reaction, right? And so if you uh, solve the combination of this equation, or if you combine the two equations, uh, in fact, you combine them, it's independent of uh, the, uh, the, the, the fact that there is a reaction sheet. But if you combine them, you get the combination of T plus Y. You integrate it from ahead of the reaction zone to behind, in other words, from a point uh, to the left of this blue line to the right of blue line. So what you get is a connection. You see that there is a relation between the gradient of the temperature and the gradient of the, of the concentration of mass fraction, which I can express as a jump, okay? So the jump in the derivative of T must be related somehow to the jump in the derivative of uh, Y with the heat release and the Lewis number as part of that relation. This is uh, uh, derived directly from this equation. Uh, another thing that uh, maybe it's expected or, or uh, assumed as you wish 
is that the temperature and the mass flow is expected to be continuous at the reaction zone. Uh, in fact, you can prove it probably. Uh, so T uh, must be, the jump in T must be zero, jump in Y must be zero. But these jump relations, despite the fact they have to be satisfied, they are not sufficient to solve the problem. Why? Because uh, what you have is one, two, three relation, right? But the problem is second order in T and Y, and you need four relations. So you need one more relation. In fact, you need one also to determine the uh, uh, flame speed. So one need one more relation to add to this in order to be able to solve the problem. And unless we discuss the detail of the structure inside the reaction zone, we're not going to get that answer. The reason I put that here is because eventually I will come back to this relation and show you that they are simple to use occasionally. OK. So uh, how do we proceed with the uh, asymptotic uh, analysis? You have a small parameter, which is the reciprocal of beta. I'm going to use the word small parameter instead of every time say reciprocal of. And so uh, you expand the temperature and the mass fraction in terms of this small parameter. The leading term, which uh, are uh, denoted here with superscript zero, satisfy this equation. I remove the superscript. And so uh, you can solve this equation. These are going to be the solution in the preheat zone and, if you like, in the post-flame zone. But in the post-flame zone, we know that Y is zero and T is the adiabatic temperature, Ta. And so uh, in the post uh, in the preheat zone, the solution of this equation is very easy. It's an exponential that uh, decay uh, uh, into the negative region, uh, as you see, and why you satisfy this. And here is a sketch of the solution. So in fact, we know the solution ahead. We know the solution behind. Uh, so you may wonder, why do I need to discuss the structure of the reaction zone? Well, I need to determine the flame speed, and that's where it is hidden, right? So. Uh, uh, to discuss the reaction zone, what we have to do, if this is the solution, we have to stretch or to zoom on the region near x equal to zero where the reaction occurs. So this is this shaded region. And the intention is to find this uh, red and blue curve that will smoothly connect the solution from one side to another. Okay? And uh, so we do that by uh, first stretching the coordinate as such. So, so uh, d by dx will vary from very large number to very small number such that x will vary, such that x go from 0 minus to 0 plus. And uh, the temperature and uh, mass fraction have to be expanded around the values which are here, which is 0 and ta. So that's what's written here. And so the perturbed value is phi and psi. And the next step is you substitute this in your equation for t and, uh, and y. And so here is the substitution. Uh, now uh, um, uh, dt by dx become d phi by dx. Uh, there is a beta minus 1. There is a small term multiplying the phi. And there is one coming from uh, the derivative here, so they cancel each other. And then in the diffusion term, you have just the beta times that, because there are two derivatives here, one beta minus one coming only from here. And uh, the reaction term uh, is, uh, is, it takes this form, where here I showed you how the exponential uh, get uh, simplified. Uh, you see T minus TA is beta minus 1 phi, so beta and beta minus 1 becomes 1, and it's approximately e to the phi, and there is this factor that comes from the denominator. Okay? So this is the uh, expression, and rho B here denote the value of rho at the reaction sheet, which is the reciprocal of TA, if you like. So the next uh, step is to balance this equation. And so... Uh, the largest term on the left is the diffusion term, right? And uh, so if I now uh, take the diffusion term and I divide by beta, uh, what I get here from the beta minus n is going to be beta minus n plus 1. 
and every, all the other terms are order one quantities. And so the balance require that, uh, in order the left to be balanced with the right, require that uh, this combination here is order one, and I refer to it as capital lambda because remember, we don't know it. That's uh, unknown. I so D, the damn color number, is written as uh, beta to the n plus one um, times uh, capital lambda plus higher terms. In other words, this is the proper expansion of the damn color number that we have identified before. Remember, before I told you there is a, uh, we forced an exponential term, but we also had an algebraic factor, and now we found what should be the algebraic factor. Okay, so what the idea is that uh, this uh, balance show that what is important physically in the reaction zone is diffusion and reaction. So the reaction zone is a diffusive reactive zone. And convection is relatively small because it's a very thin region, and so it doesn't affect the detail inside. So the next step will be to solve this equation. But note that this equation is only for the perturbation of the temperature. We have to also write an equation for the perturbation of uh, the reactant psi. But the equations are very similar, so you expect a very similar equation, and indeed, uh, this is what you get for the uh, uh, perturbation of uh, Y, with, of course, the Lewis number there. And so uh, the next step is uh, solving this nonlinear equation, but you solve them in a domain which is on the small scale, goes essentially from negative infinity to plus infinity. This is the region that you zoomed on. So what condition, what boundary condition do you use to satisfy, to satisfy, to, to, to apply to this equation? Well, uh, the boundary condition that you use are known as matching condition. And matching is not patching. Matching is not trying to say, oh, there is at one point one solution have the same value as the other one. That's patching. Matching means that the two solutions blend into each other. In other words, the behavior of one solution when you go towards the other one has the same behavior as the solution in that region. Or in other words, if I take the the solution in the preheat zone, right, for all x, and I expand it to see how it behaved near x equal to zero, and x equal to zero is now described by this zoom uh, new coordinate. And so near x equal to zero, you see that by expanding this uh, uh, with, uh, in terms of beta minus one, t behave is like a linear function and y behave like a linear function, right? And so, what you expect is that the solution in that uh, uh, reaction zone will go to some uh, uh, slope which is dictated by uh, the outer solution. These are referred to as matching condition. Okay, so uh, we derived here the matching condition, and so uh, in, in, in fact, uh, you can uh, express them in a, when you compare this to the solution or to the form of the solution in the reaction zone, it tells you that phi must go like uh, this straight line and psi like this uh, slope, okay? Now, by the way, this condition, and on the burn side, of course, it has to go to zero because it's already a constant there, either zero or ta. Um, this condition, in fact, is not one condition, it's in fact two conditions, because it tells you that phi has to go to this value and the phi dx c has to go to qyu. So it's, a, it's important to note that. Okay, so uh, here are the, again the two uh, equations for phi and psi and all the matching conditions. So that at least mathematically we have a well-posed problem to address and uh, this is schematically what you should expect. Uh, this is the mass fraction, so the correction psi will go from the proper uh, slope into zero, and this is for the temperature from the slope to zero, okay? So 
So we have to see if we can solve this equation to obtain these scopes. Uh, it's easy to first see that you can do a coupling function here because independent of the Lewis number, when you have only diffusion and reaction, you can always combine the two equations to eliminate the right-hand side. So when you do that, you obtain that the sum here is equal to zero, and if you apply the boundary condition, you see that there is a relation between phi and psi, in other words, between the perturbation of the temperature and the perturbation of the mass fraction. We are up to 10.15, is this 11.15? Uh, huh? No, no, but the, the until 11.15, it's, I, I, I lost the time. 10 minutes, okay, fine. I will, I'm gonna, uh, I will not finish this lecture, I'll finish it next time, I'll skip some of the other things. So, um, so uh, this is one relation. So if you have this relation, you can, of course, uh, replace the phi in the exponential and reduce the equation to a single equation. So uh, this is uh, what's uh, done in this box. You have a single equation for psi where the phi in the exponential was replaced by the linear relation between them. And those are the two matching conditions. So uh, it turned out that we can integrate this equation once because we can multiply the left and right hand side by the derivative, dip psi dx c. When you multiply by dip psi dx c, this is uh, equivalent to that because you see if you take the derivative of this, you get two times the derivative times the second derivative, which is exactly this, and the two cancel. And on the right-hand side, you have the psi dx c. So now you can integrate with respect to c, and uh, since the integration here will effectively be, if you integrate, you have dx c, dx c, so integration the psi. So you have an integral which you have to uh, evaluate, and on the left-hand side, you have the derivative the psi dx c squared. This is only one integration. Of course, second equation requires two integration, but I'll talk about that in a minute. So uh, before we uh, talk about the second integration, we can evaluate this uh, as using the boundary condition. So if we use the condition at negative infinity, uh, then uh, the psi dx at negative infinity should satisfy this condition. So it should give you yu squared le squared divided by 2, which is here. Okay? And uh, when you evaluate plus infinity is 0, so it's irrelevant. When you evaluate uh, uh, th this integral, uh, when, when xi goes to negative infinity, you see that uh, psi. Uh, goes to uh, infinity, and so that's it. psi will go to infinity. And uh, when uh, uh, xi goes to z uh, when uh, xi goes to uh, plus infinity, psi goes to zero. So those are the two limits here. And so that integral is effectively a gamma function of the reaction order n. And so uh, you have an expression here that involve quantities that you know, and you can determine this capital lambda, which is related to the burning rate eigenvalue. So uh, that's the previous relation that I had on the slide. Uh, this is the, uh, the write-up of it, and so you solve for capital lambda, you get this, and if you now put it back into the damn Kohler number, you get an expression, uh, which tells you what the burning rate eigenvalue is. And to obtain the flame speed, you have to uh, rewrite the, 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 the damn color number, uh, the definition of the damn color number, which, did I skip something? No, it's okay. So you write, uh, this is a repetition of what I had before. So if you use the definition of the dam color number, uh, you can uh, write an expression for the laminar flame speed, which I wrote here in dimensional form. Uh, note that it's written for any reaction order, and uh, the adiabatic temperature was written was uh, written in dimensional form, 
And uh, I refer that to the flame thickness, but I said it's not exactly, the, it's a representative uh, thickness, and I'll comment about that soon. Um, okay, so I, I went at length a little bit with the detail, but I just wanted to give you the main ideas of how uh, this was derived and some of the uh, uh, way that we, uh, uh, you know, approach the problem in a systematic way. Uh, we followed up to now one reactant. If there are two reactants, uh, fuel and oxidizer, the expression will be a little different, and I will, uh, I think, soon uh, show you what it is. Uh, I'm just thinking if there is any additional comment I want to make about this here, no. So uh, before, yeah, before I show you about two components, I said before that this was only the first integration. In principle, it's not sufficient because you have to do a second integration to see that, in fact, the solution does make that connection. Uh, the second integration uh, have to be done numerically. It cannot be done analytically. And uh, you can express it in terms of an integral. It's too complicated, but I uh, just uh, I'm showing you here effect effectively a numerical solution that show for phi, for example, how it properly connects the right slope on the left to the slope uh, equal to zero on the right. Okay, so uh, back to the uh, uh, expression that we derived. So I focused on the flame speed in this uh, relation here. Yeah, but uh, essentially I can also look at this and uh, interpret this to be what is the psi dxc? Psi was the reactant mass fraction. So this is the gradient of the Y of the reactant uh, near the reaction zone. So effectively, it's the flux of fuel into the reaction zone. And so this is uh, the way I re-expressed it in this expression. So the psi dx essentially is dy dx at x equal to zero. So we also have from here an expression for the mass flux of reactant into the reaction zone. This is the, the missing piece of information that I showed you before if I use a jump condition across the reaction zone, which is needed to complete the problem. And in fact, uh, you can integrate this equation from, uh, say, from, uh, neg uh, from across the flame. This is the species equation. So you integrate it from x equal to 0 minus to 0 plus. Since y is essentially zero in that region, this term doesn't contribute anything. And uh, the integration of this gives you the value at zero plus, which is zero. The value at zero minus is equal to the integral of omega, which is often referred to as the consumption speed, which is the consumption rate of the reactant, which is uh, the consumption only occur in that thin region. So uh, effectively, this condition uh, it can be equivalent to the flame speed as giving you the mass flux of reactant into the reaction zone that it's needed for complete combustion. So in principle, I can use these three condition and I don't have to redo the structure every other time. And these three condition can give you actually the answer that uh, uh, you are interested um, uh, to solve the problem. So let's say I would have given you the problem, solve the plane of flame. Uh, there is a reaction sheet at x equal to zero across which this condition has to be satisfied, okay? And you can solve it ahead of the flame because it's a simple exponential. Behind the flame, it's a constant or it's zero. And satisfy this condition, you get the right answer. You get the flame speed. Okay, of course, this was known only when we derived the structure. I will use this in a few examples that you will see later. So this is the uh, essentially what I describe in words. I'm going to make a break in a few minutes. Uh, so just uh, give me one or two more minutes. 
Uh, the consequence of uh, the, uh, a few other points uh, that can be made from this uh, discussion uh, is that uh, the reaction occur in a very narrow region near the temperature, uh, near the adiabatic temperature Ta, which I refer to as the reaction zone, uh, and LR is the thickness of that reaction zone. The preheat zone is essentially the region where the temperature drops from the adiabatic temperature to almost Tu. Uh, the exponential solution, uh, if you put an exponential of minus five or six, it was exponential of basically x, minus five or six, you see that it's already 10 to the minus two or so. So the true thickness of the preheat zone, it's about five times LF, uh, where the exponential dropped to about 99% to its value towards the unburned gas. So it's not LF, but it's five times LF. LF is a representative scale. The thickness is five LF. Uh, a common way to, in numerical simulation, to determine the flame thickness uh, is to take the slope at the inflection point and uh, then to determine this distance between uh, uh, which is the, determined here as Ta minus Tu divided by the slope of that. Uh, that will give an equivalent uh, value to this, perhaps a little less, a little more, uh, depend. Okay, uh, and uh, this is the second comment or the, another comment that I could have done this whole analysis allowing for thermal conductivity to depend on temperatures, just that my expression would have been a little bit more uh, involved. Uh, and uh, but uh, straightforward uh, and uh, to complete the solution I discussed temperature and mass fraction what about density and velocity well it's straightforward the density is the reciprocal of the temperature and since uh, rho u is a constant then u is a basically in dimensionless form is essentially t so uh, we know the density we know the temperature what about the pressure the small pressure variation well, you can compute them also from the momentum equation, and you get uh, the, this uh, uh, two expression, which show basically that there is a drop, a slight drop in, in pressure across the flame. And this is known from the rankine ugonio relation. Remember the, the, the deflagration, the pressure drops. So this is computed here. And... Um, Okay, this is just a minor comment. This says the strong dependence of the Arrhenius rate uh, uh, show that a small variation in flame temperature can cause an order one or significant change in speed. And that's an important result which have been used uh, later to actually advance uh, the theory uh, of premixed flame, which I discussed in... Uh, uh, in, in uh, tomorrow in other lectures. So let's stop here and we will continue uh, from this after the break. But uh, there is a lot in my uh, slides, much more than I can cover, and so I will have uh, in at least uh, to you know, make some changes, so pick up and choose what I want to cover. So let me continue where we were. Uh, we uh, essentially derived uh, an expression, an analytical expression for the laminar flame speed, and I want now uh, essentially to discuss various properties of this uh, uh, reaction, uh, of this expression. First of all, uh, here is a comparison between uh, the asymptotic expression that we derived for n equal to 1 and the specific value of the heat release q equal to 5 with a numerical uh, solution. The reason uh, for uh, this uh, uh, value is because numerically you have to choose some parameters uh, to, to, to make the comparison. Okay, and so uh, the uh, graph showed the ratio of the numeric to the asymptotic, so of course uh, it would have been one if it's exact, but clearly it's a, an approximation. And so what you see is for beta approximately 10, beta being the Zeldovich number, I told you it's approximately 10, 
Uh, the error uh, for most Lewis number, except for the large one, it's about uh, five to at least five, eight percent. So it's not very large. Uh, and uh, of course, as asymptotic theory is, the larger the parameter or the smaller the small parameter, depending what you have, uh, the better the approximation is. In fact, it is. It tend to one as beta become larger and larger. Okay, so this is one comment. Uh, it's interesting, by the way, to note that uh, for different Lewis number less than one and bigger than one, the approach is from above or from below, but doesn't have any physical consequences, just uh, the expression, the way the expression was uh, obtained. Uh, the next uh, comment here, I just wrote the laminar flame speed in different forms. So uh, here, uh, the expression that I derived before uh, you see the density of the burned gas and density of the unburned gas, uh, and uh, you can uh, uh, re-express, uh, what did I do here? Well, in one case, I, uh, I uh, yeah, okay, I, I bring in here the density to be the ratio to the N in both cases, so there is an unburned value that was pulled out, and then uh, somewhere else there is, uh, uh, the, the beta was replaced with the beta naught, and remember in the beta naught, uh, the difference between two, there was a TA minus one. Anyway, it's a rewrite of the same expression. So if you like, this one doesn't have, uh, the Zeldovich number had uh, just the activation energy parameter as I originally defined it. And in this one, I replace the density with the pressure. So any one of those could be useful depending on uh, your need. So that's what was used in the different expression. Okay, this was a minor thing. The more important thing is perhaps uh, to bring in now two reactants. So fuel and oxidizer. So now um, uh, the expression have uh, included this extra uh, parameter here, S, or extra factor S. Uh, and the uh, expression is written only for n equal to two is uh, a reaction order with respect to fuel and oxidizer one. So uh, what you see is that there is a dependence on the uh, equivalence ratio phi, uh, which is given here. And uh, you can easily see that uh, this expression reduced to the previous one when the mixture is very lean or very rich because then only one species uh, uh, become um, relevant. Uh, and uh, note that both Lewis number appear in the expression, uh, uh, well, uh, depend uh, on, uh, uh, on phi, but some in, in, in general, both expression, Lewis number of fuel and oxidized would appear, but if phi is very small, for example, then only one would appear, which is a deficient one as we have anticipated before. So anyway, this is a more general relation and it's consistent with all the previous one. And uh, at stoichiometry, when phi is equal to one, it reduced to this form. And here you see uh, very uh, clearly that both Lewis number enter the expression. Okay, now uh, some observation uh, from the laminar flame speed. First of all, you notice that uh, the flame speed was proportional to the exponential e to the minus e over RTA. And that's where, and this is probably, uh, and that's where the, uh, effectively the heat release or the, the, fa the strongest factor of the heat release appear in the flame speed. It appears through TA because remember TA essentially is TA minus TU is proportional to the heat release Q. So, um, uh, Uh, not sure what I wanted to show in this graph. Uh, oh, oh, I know. Uh, so uh, similar, <laughs> similar to the fact that we have seen yesterday that the adiabatic temperature uh, reach its peak near uh, stoichiometry. So uh, since uh, uh, the speed is essentially uh, proportional to that, then it also uh, reach uh, its maximum speed at stoichiometry, and those are 
uh, values taken from different uh, experiments or different computation with different numerical scheme. The flame thickness, on the other hand, is, uh, is inversely proportional to SL, and so uh, it will be uh, essentially the smallest uh, uh, near equivalence ratio, uh, near the stoichiometry. Uh, now the dependence on the heat release or on Q, okay, again appear from this exponential. And so what you see from uh, this experiment that uh, uh, the larger Q is, uh, then the larger the flame speed, which is uh, clearly what you would see here. The larger Q, the larger TA makes the ratio smaller, being in a negative make it larger. So uh, the larger Q show a larger speed immediately from the analytical expression. If the changes in Q is not very large, as here it's almost 40% increase or so, uh, then uh, you expect that the flame speed will not rise uh, very much or not be much larger. And so you see for butane, pentane, hexane, heptane, the flame, uh, the, the flame speed is, despite the change in Q, which is relatively minor, uh, is about the same, okay? So indistinguishable effect due to the relative small change in Q. Uh, this is another interesting uh, uh, comparison that you can uh, see. Uh, all, this is the result of a flame speed of uh, methane in various uh, oxygen inert. So the inert could be nitrogen, helium, or argon. But you see there is a significantly different uh, um, uh, flame speed of, uh, of the propen, uh, pro, uh, of the methane, uh, ox uh, methane oxidation uh, because of the inert. Now, this can also be seen that is consistent with what the expression will show you. Uh, all mixture have the same heat release, so the heat release is not the factor. Argon and nitrogen have approximately the same thermal diffusivity, uh, argon and uh, nitrogen, okay? Um, but, uh, where am I? Uh, it's the same thermal diffusivity, but the adiabatic temperature is larger uh, for the argon mixture, okay, because of the significantly lower CP. So the adiabatic temperature for the argon mixture is 2514 compared to 2214. Consequently, you expect the flame speed for argon to be larger than for nitrogen, and you see here it's about uh, 80 compared to 20, okay? Now, uh, the flame temperature, if you compare now with helium, helium is a mixture is nearly, have the same flame temperature as the argon mixture, okay? The 22, uh, 25 and 25, about. Uh, but the higher speed uh, is due to the higher thermal diffusivity of helium, uh, which is, is 1.64 compared to, to the other two. So, uh, you can deduce all these directly from the analytical expression. Uh, another interesting comment is this, the dependence on the Lewis number. So we saw that, you, you notice that I just pick up only the important factor in the expression. I didn't write the entire expression. So we've seen that uh, it's uh, basically proportional to the product of the Lewis number of the fuel and oxidizer, the square root. In the expression before, it was the reciprocal in the denominator, which is the same as that. And so uh, uh, for um, methane, which is uh, uh, basically the Lewis number is near one in air, where the Lewis number is not too far from one, then what you see, there is a correlation, so to speak, between the flame temperature and the flame speed. In other words, they both change in the same way. Uh, on the other hand, in uh, hydrogen, you see that uh, the, the shape is quite significantly different between the speed and the adiabatic temperature. And the reason is because uh, for uh, lean condition here, uh, the Lewis number is quite small, 
and so uh, it, it caused uh, a certain behavior relative to the flame temperature. But on the rich side, it's the oxidizer which dictate uh, uh, the expression. And uh, this is not small. It's like approximately one. So you see a different, uh, the, there is no direct correlation between the two. OK. Uh, this is uh, just uh, also to show the dependence of the flame speed on pressure. And uh, from the expression that we derived, we had a rho burn to the n over 2 uh, and divide by rho u. So that essentially, if you translate it in pressure, you get p to the n over 2 minus 1. And so uh, clearly, uh, if n uh, is, uh, which is usually, uh, uh, well, it's less than 2, then the flame speed decreases with the pressure, and that's what most experiments show. OK? Uh, the flame uh, thickness, on the other hand, is inversely, it's, it has another rho u here, so the, that kills the minus 1. And so uh, Lf will be uh, inversely proportional to p to the n over 2, which indicate that as you increase the pressure, the flame thickness, the flame becomes th uh, thinner. And that's uh, uh, another uh, result which is consistent with the experiment. So uh, this is uh, some comparison that I show. And here I uh, again summarize that single slide that I showed you earlier, that effectively the derivation of the flame speed is equivalent, or the derivation of the, the, the activation energy asymptote is equivalent to saying that I can solve the problem in the preheat zone and in the post re, in the, the post reaction zone, as provided uh, uh, that uh, all these conditions are satisfied, namely uh, that the temperature and the species are continuous at the reaction zone, which is what we expected, that there is a relation between the gradient of the temperature, in other words, the heat conducted away from the reaction zone and the uh, mass flux of reactant towards the reaction zone, and that the mass flux that uh, uh, enter the reaction zone is given by this expression, which is basically an, Ar of an Arrhenius form, but specifically in that way, which was derived from the uh, solution, is equivalent to say that the flame speed is equal to uh, this expression. Why did I bring that up? Because uh, if, oh, it's not here. OK, so it will come later. But maybe I should say something about it before. Uh, I'll come. It will come later. OK, so uh, I want to move to the next uh, slide, uh, the next, um, next lecture. But I'm going to skip quite a bit of things and focus only on few things. Uh, so the next one was discussing quenching and ignition. I'm going to skip some of the first slide and talk about quenching or effect of heat loss on the uh, laminar flame speed. Uh, the comment that I wanted to make about before that I said I thought it was in my slide, it will come tomorrow. It's essentially a generalization of those conditions for a flame, which is not highly curved or weakly curved, so, but we will talk about it tomorrow. So uh, now uh, we want to re-examine the problem uh, where we have some uh, heat losses uh, from, um, uh, you know, from the combustion region. The boundary conditions are very similar to what we had before. Uh, of course, we have to add a heat loss term to the equation. And we expect that the flame speed, again, this is written in the frame of reference moving with the flame. So we expect that the flame speed S is going to be a number less than the laminar flame speed, right? So S is supposed to be less than, expect that, right? And of course, we expect also that the flame temperature due to the heat loss will be less than the adiabatic temperature, OK? So it's just, uh, just a general comment. So uh, here are the equations, and those are written 
so far in dimensional form. Again, I will focus only on one reactant because it's uh, simpler to describe. So the continuity equation, uh, the energy equation with the heat loss term G of T, I'll say a few words about it in a minute, and uh, this is the species equation, the deficient reactant. Uh, okay, so the heat loss term that we are interested in, it's a volumetric heat loss. In other words, it's uh, uh, energy per volume, per unit volume, per unit time. And uh, it's written as a function of temperature. And in particular, uh, it has to vanish uh, at in the far uh, uh, upstream. In other words, we assume that the heat loss is a, a function of T minus Tu, such that uh, uh, very far upstream, it goes to zero. Otherwise, we are going to have, again, uh, a cold boundary difficulty that uh, we have encountered before. But of course, that is a condition that does make sense. Um, so if uh, the heat loss was some conductive heat losses, say if this was perhaps a tube and this conduction from the walls, then it will be of the form uh, uh, some uh, K, uh, which is a heat transfer parameter T minus Tu, linear, linear function. If it's radiative losses, then uh, using a Stefan uh, relation, it's going to be uh, G uh, will be some K T to the 4 minus T U to the 4. Okay? So, but actually, the derivation will leave G general. So you can use any type of heat loss you want, as long as it's of the form that depend on temperature. So uh, the first step is to non-dimensionalize the equation. Since we already know now what the laminar flame speed is uh, under adiabatic condition, we use that as our reference velocity. So the reference velocity is the laminar flame speed. It's not an unknown anymore. Uh, then uh, the lengths, as before, diffusion lengths, uh, density and temperature uh, reference to the unburned gas. And, uh, of course, you have to scale uh, the heat loss term. Now, uh, this is not uh, maybe a trivial uh, uh, thing to, to, to uh, um, the way that it's scaled, but I have to say a word about it. Effectively, it's scaled relative to the heat of combustion. But as you notice, there is a beta here. In other words, I added here uh, a, uh, an activation energy parameter in it. So the idea is that the heat loss, as you will see in the appearing in the equation, is relatively small. OK? Uh, so you can ask me, why do you look at relatively small uh, heat losses? Well, what I will argue, as you will see at the end, small heat loss will quench the flame. So large heat loss, of course, will quench it. So it turned out that it's the proper, as I earlier uh, told you the proper distinguished limit to examine to get uh, a correct answer to the problem. Okay, so uh, uh, everything else is known. Ta is just adiabatic temperature as a reference in dimensionless form, dimensional form. These are the dimensionless equation, and the little s is the ratio of the uh, non-adiabatic to the adiabatic flame speed. So a little s would appear here because rho u is s. And uh, then these are the same equation that you have seen before with the addition term here. And the boundary condition are here. u goes to little s as x goes to infinity. And uh, rho t goes to 1. y is the unburned known value. Uh, at far, far at infinity, things go to uniform, and the fuel is all consumed. OK, so um, it's important to note that uh, even before doing anything, in, in the, before any discussion, if I uh, add those two equations, I get uh, an equation that combines T and Y. Again, it's not exactly an equation that can be solved because those are not the same variables, but it's, a, it's an expression that it's useful. Uh, but it's an expression that is good for all orders uh, in the parameter beta minus 1 because I didn't make any simplification uh, 
uh, in obtaining it, okay? And we are gonna use it uh, uh, in a minute. So uh, for large activation energy, we expect again that we're gonna have a reaction sheet, okay? A preheat zone and a postheat zone, and we assume that the reaction sheet is without loss of generality at x equal to zero. So we want to solve the equation uh, with reaction negligible on the left and on the right. So for x positive, x negative. So these are the equation to solve, uh, and uh, the condition across the reaction sheet are the uh, very similar to what we I showed you in the, the last slide of the previous lecture. Uh, the continuity, the relation between the gradient and this relation for the mass flux that we have uh, derived before. Uh, but there is a one generalization here, and that's why I am missing that slide that I wanted to discuss. Uh, since the, uh, now the, uh, the flame temperature is not the adiabatic temperature, uh, what I have done in this expression is modify the exponential instead of E over 2RTA, the adiabatic temperature when it was for the adiabatic flame, I uh, uh, generalize it with a temperature TF. Now you may ask, uh, why are you allowed to do this? The answer is I can do it systematically the same way that I derived the uh, previous relation, but it's a much simpler way to presented. So it's correct, but uh, I am just giving you maybe a hand wave uh, answer why it is correct. Uh, and so the mass flux into the reaction zone can be in fact expressed in this way, which is a difference between the exponential at TA and TF uh, multiplied by uh, essentially, uh, if you want, it's the, the mass, the incoming mass flux. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, jump condition in dimensional form, and in dimensionless form, using the scaling that I have introduced before, uh, these will introduce here the heat release parameter Q and the Lewis number, okay, which is quite clear. This one uh, will essentially, you see that there is a rho D here, if I divide by lambda over Cp, then I bring the Lewis number in front, so that's where this come from, and then uh, made it making dimensional. Then only the yu would appear because this is one, and uh, in the scale of the x, and then um, and then uh, the the exponential will be uh, of this form if uh, instead if the Zeldovich number beta come uh, into play. So this is just a substitution. It's very straightforward. Now, uh, I expect that since the heat losses are small, then the flame temperature will not be very far from the adiabatic temperature. And so the difference, so I write the flame temperature as adiabatic temperature plus a small correction. This TA minus one is just a factor for convenience, nothing special. Phi star effectively is the deviation or the drop in uh, temperature from the adiabatic, phi star. So uh, in this expression, e to the minus phi star over two appear. The reason you see for this TA minus one is to cancel this one, so I have a simple exponential uh, to, to deal with. So these are the conditions that I want to apply in order to solve my problem. Okay, so uh, I go back to this combined uh, equation that I told you before that can be derived for all orders, and uh, I integrate it from negative infinity up to and including the reaction zone. In other words, up to behind the reaction zone, so up to zero plus. Okay, so at zero plus, we know that on the uh, burn side, T is TF, Y is zero. So that gives you this TF. On the unburn side, namely at negative infinity, you have TU plus QYU or one plus Q, which is TA. So that's where this come from, okay? Now let's focus on the second term. At negative infinity, then uh, the derivative is zero, so it's not appearing here, but at zero plus, there is a slope, and I don't know what the slope is. In, under adiabatic condition, it was zero, but now it may not be, and so it remains as an unknown to be determined. 
And then on the right-hand side, when I integrate this uh, quantity, it's uh, going to be somehow the total uh, loss due to the heat loss. OK, since we have assumed, and that's really where the importance of this beta minus 1 come in, since uh, this is a, a beta minus 1 term, you expect that also the slope behind uh, the flame is also beta minus 1. So the expression that you end up obtaining from here is beta minus 1, beta minus 1, beta minus 1. In other words, it's all balanced correctly. This is the term coming from here. This is the uh, term that I have to evaluate. And this is the known heat loss that we can, for a given g, we can evaluate. OK, so uh, uh, this is one equation that relates the flame temperature perturbation, phi star, uh, to the, uh, well, that give you the, if you like, the flame, uh, tem uh, no, to the flame speed, little s. Then uh, you have a second relation, which come from this, I want to go back, but now I went too far back, uh, that comes from here, from this, mass flux quantity that I derived earlier. So uh, it tells you that uh, uh, dy by dx at x equal to 0 minus is equal to this. So when I, I just copied it here. So this is another relation that will give us a dependence of the, of the perturbation of the flame temperature. Uh, and so these two relations are two relations for the flame temperature and the flame speed, little s and phi star, OK? So now we have to solve the, the equation in the preheat zone and uh, in the post-heat zone. And so in the preheat zone, the y equation is very easy. Like before, it's an exponential, and then it's a 0 on the burn side. So this is the solution. Uh, what about the, for the temperature? Uh, the temperature in the unburned zone, in the, I mean the preheat zone, to leading order is again the exponential like before. Oh, by the way, note that there is one uh, thing to pay attention to. There is an s here, uh, so the exponential will involve e to the s x, of course. Okay, so okay. So uh, for the temperature, uh, we have this uh, equation, and so it's, uh, it's again an exponential. That's to leading order. In other words, not accounting for this term. Uh, if you want the correction, you have to take the next term, but it turned out that it's not of interest, uh, uh, so I did not compute it. On the other hand, in the burn side, we needed the slope. Remember, it was part of the equation that we needed. And so on the burn side, we have to uh, expand the solution. The solution will be expanded as a thematic temperature plus a perturbation, T1. And the flame temperature, that was a notation that I used before. Remember, Ta with the definition of phi star. So to order one, uh, we have to solve this equation now on the burn side, right? And it's the same equation. And so this equation on the burn side, T to leading order is Ta. Of course, it satisfies this when this term is gone. And to the next order, then you have s dt1 by dx and the second derivative equal on the right hand side, it's the value at the previous order, namely when g is ta. So it's a perturbation scheme. So when you, uh, uh, when you substitute in, you get the differential equation for t1. And so you can solve it. It has an exponential term, but on the burn side, the exponential has to, you know, the constant in front of it has to be zero because it cannot grow exponentially. And so the solution is going to give you uh, a straight line of that form, which depends on x. Okay. So this is the temperature solution. On the unburned side, is still the exponential that decay to one. And on the burn side, it's just a small drop or a linear drop uh, that I will show you a uh, picture in a minute. Uh, the important thing that we wanted to compute was the slope, remember? And so we can compute the slope from here. OK. So uh, here is the picture of the two solutions. 
the uh, Y and the T, okay? And the adiabatic one is the black dashed curve, and this is the slow uh, drop due to heat loss. All right. Uh, remember that, uh, in principle, you want to smooth out the solution here and here uh, using the reaction zone structure, but that's exactly what we did before. We generalize it here, so we don't have to redo it, basically. Okay, so now he, th those are the two relations I told you that we define the flame temperature and flame speed. And, uh, and uh, since we have computed dt dx, and since we know the solution of y on the unburned side, we can substitute for this and for this. And uh, we end up with two relations, which are written here. In other words, this is the substitution of those two terms. And uh, you get that phi star is the minus the log of S squared, and S phi star is the integral of the heat loss term plus one over S, the heat loss term at TA. So these are the effectively the two uh, equations we are looking for. And the last one, if we make a proper substitution in the, we make a change of variable of the, uh, in the integral from T to what T is, which I call Z, then this integral become a simple integral with one over S popped out. A simple integral, I mean it's an, if you know G, you compute it. There is no unknown in it, okay? Note that uh, this is uh, a contribution from 1 to Ta. In other words, a contribution from the unburned temperature all the way to the flame. So this is, in fact, the contribution of the heat loss from the preheat zone. And this is G at Ta, which is the heat loss on the, from the burn side. But since the temperature to leading order is Ta, then that's what the... Uh, uh, the heat loss contribution is. So the sum is the total heat loss from both the preheat and the post flame zone. And I, since it's a quantity that you, knowing G, you can evaluate it, I call it QL, okay, Q loss. And so the uh, expression here tells you that S phi star is one over S QL, and if you substitute these two relation, you get S square log S square is equal to minus QL. So that's an expression for the flame speed. By the way, QL uh, for uh, conductive uh, heat loss, where uh, G is Q T minus one, can be easily computed. The QL is this. For, uh, for the radiative loss, well, you have to do that integral numerically or in other ways, and uh, you get the value, but it's, it's not crucial. So now I want to focus on this relation. I want to plot this relation. Note that when Q equal to zero, in other words, no heat loss, then there are two solutions. One is S equal to one, right? Because the log of one is zero. So that's S equal to one means the flame speed of an adiabatic flame. And there is another solution, which is S equal to zero, which we did not uh, have before, but it's a solution. So uh, here is the graph of that curve. Uh, here are the two solutions, S equal to one and S equal to zero. And when you plot this, as you increase the heat loss, uh, of course, the speed uh, drop decreases up to a point, then there is a turning point, and it reached that other solution. Uh, this part of the branch is unstable. It can be proved, uh, but it's also, it makes sense. When you increase the heat loss, you don't expect the flame speed to increase. Uh, and so it's unstable. And so the only stable part is this. Uh, so the idea is that when you increase the loss, the flame speed decrease, 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 up to that point. If you decrease a little more the heat loss, there is no solution. In other words, no flame can propagate at uh, any speed beyond that point, and uh, that's why it's referred to as an extinction point. And uh, note that the extinction point occur where the flame speed is approximately, uh, it's exactly one over square root of E in the analysis, uh, e is the 2.7 and so on, and so this is approximately 60% 
a drop from the laminar flying speed, and the extinction value is about 0.37 if you evaluate it, uh, but that's, of course, based on the dimensionalization that we have used. Okay. Um, a question that I uh, did not uh, uh, comment on before is uh, that uh, th there is a problem with that solution that I showed you, that um, that the that the so the flame go like this and then it goes down right linearly, but uh, that's not an acceptable solution because eventually straight line will cross the axis and we go negative and so it's not correct, right? And so if you do a careful analysis, it's true that you can accept it, but you have to make sure that everything fall into place correctly. And so what, how to explain that? Well, what you expect actually is that the flame uh, temperature and the flame, the temperature will eventually decrease back to the cold temperature to one, and uh, in fact that is the case. It's just that that happened on a much larger scale, which is x beta uh, uh, x. So without uh, showing too much the details, uh, on a larger scale, this is how the temperature drop from the flame temperature exponentially to one but it happened on a much, much larger scale than the uh, diffusion scale that we have used to, to describe the, uh, the solution in this range, okay? So that cleaned that part. Uh, there are a few examples or important uh, observation uh, that this quenching uh, uh, of the uh, Flame speed, for example, uh, in, in, it was uh, very early uh, shown uh, by uh, Humphrey Davy uh, in the early 1800s that uh, if he have a lamp that uh, has a metal goes used uh, around it to distribute heat loss to a sufficiently large area, that uh, the flame that uh, 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 he used in this lamp to go into coal mine will not propagate out and will not cause an explosion. And uh, the value, of course, the, of the total heat loss have to be uh, larger than that critical value for this uh, not to happen. Uh, another uh, example is flame propagation in narrow tube. So narrow tube, uh, if the radius is smaller than a critical value, a flame will not propagate in, another observation which is well known. Uh, the, in the analysis, the total conductive losses from the wall will be the circumference, 2 pi r, multiplied by the length, uh, but the heat loss per unit volume, which we added uh, in the analysis, it's gonna be uh, 2 pi r over L divided by the uh, uh, volume pi r square l. So QL uh, scaled correctly is 1 over r. So if Q is above a critical value cause extinction, means r below a certain critical value cause extinction. Okay? That's another example. Uh, the next uh, thing before uh, we, we finish and drop the remaining of the uh, uh, lecture is uh, to uh, bring you some example from two-dimensional uh, uh, flame in a channel. Now, uh, so this is a, a flame propagating in a channel uh, at, uh, under, uh, well, there is no reactant, uh, uh, in other words, uh, uh, the, the derivative of y have to go to zero at the wall, no penetration, but, um, uh, there is a, uh, the temperature gradient is equal to some k times t minus tu, where k here is different than the k before, it's just the heat transfer parameter at the wall. Okay? Now, um, the, uh, when k uh, is equal to uh, zero, then the TDY is zero, means it's adiabatic condition. When, t, when k goes to infinity, 
uh, it means that T is equal to Tu, it means isothermal condition, now we're keeping the wall at a constant temperature. So those are the two extreme, because keeping the wall at a constant temperature will cause a significant loss uh, to reach that uh, temperature. Okay, so uh, the, the result I want to show you are based on uh, numerical computation because now you have to solve the uh, equation in uh, X and Y, uh, and it's not amenable to analytical solution. And uh, it, for simplicity, uh, the, those results were done at a constant density, in other words, without really uh, uh, seeing the effect of thermal expansion on the flame. Nevertheless, you will see that provide interesting results, uh, and so um, uh, that's what I will show you. I will also show you a result for unity Lewis number, uh, so even though the discussion for non-unity Lewis number also appear in the literature, and uh, the activation energy for the numerical computation was taken to be beta equal to 10. By the way, in numerical computation, the adiabatic, the, the equations are solved using a finite rate chemistry, but one step. In other words, you solve the full equations. Uh, in the analysis delta, which is uh, the channel width in terms of the flame thickness, the channel width is 2A divided by LF, uh, is denoted by delta, and K I discussed before, okay? Now, if the, since the flame is propagating in a tube, it's not, and, and I'm sorry, since there is heat loss, it's not expected that you're gonna have a plane of flame, okay? If it was uh, under this assumption, namely without thermal expansion and so on, uh, if it was adiabatic, you would expect the plane of flame because there's nothing in the equation that would change that. But, um, uh, here you don't expect, so the flame will be curved. So uh, here are uh, results for delta equal to 20, which is relatively a wide channel, and I'll show you next result for a narrower channel. So uh, again, if it's adiabatic, you see the results show that uh, the flame is planar. Those are reaction rate contour, in other words, where omega takes different... Uh, level set where omega is, is a, uh, take a constant value, so it's clearly zero here, zero here, it's important here. Those are uh, temperature contour or isotherm, if you like. When you increase K, K to five, then the flame starts to curve, as you expect, and you see that the reaction is not uniform as it was before, which is what you anticipate, and uh, when you increase it all the way to K, infinity, which is an isothermal, isothermal wall, then uh, the flame is really more curved. Oh, by the way, this is, uh, I'm plotting here only half of the channel. So there is another half here or another half here, okay? So this is the center line, this is the end of the channel. And so when K goes to infinity, what you see there is a dead space. In other words, the flame exists only in part of the channel, only in the center or near the center, and it's quenched on top and the bottom. But that's what this uh, picture show. But what you see is that you can increase the heat loss as much as you want and still get a solution. On the other hand, if uh, you have a narrow channel, uh, K equal to zero, again, you get the planar flame, then uh, the flame start to curve, uh, you get to a value of about 28.1. Of course, those values are dimensionless, so you have to understand that. Uh, it's not a pure number. And so again, the flame uh, is curved, there is a dead space. If you try to increase K above 28.1, you find no solution, okay? So again, the flame, uh, when K exceeds a finite critical value, the total flame is quenched. Here you have a partial quenching near the wall, here you have a total quench eventually. And uh, if you graph uh, the, the propagation speed of the non-adiabatic relative to the laminar flame speed as a function of heat loss, uh, it's very interesting that when uh, delta is small, which is very narrow channel, right? Uh, then uh, the quenching uh, or the total quenching occur at approximately 60%, which was the result of the uh, simple one-dimensional 
uh, analysis. And when uh, you uh, uh, go to larger uh, or, or a wider channel, then uh, the flame would exist and propagate, of course, slower, uh, even if the heat loss is much larger. So the conclusions are written here. Total extinction in narrow channel of a width smaller than approximately 15 uh, laminar flame speed occur. That's what these are. The quenching diameter is of that value. It's approximately in accord with at least an order of magnitude, similar to what you see in the experiment. Uh, only partial extinction occur in wider channel. The flame persists for all value of K, but it's confined to the center with the dead space, and the dead space seems to be, from the numerical solution, estimated at about six times the laminar flame thickness, which is about right. Okay? Uh, that's it, actually, and so I will, sorry, I will not discuss any of the ignition part, and tomorrow we will uh, continue with the, I told you when I started that I have much more in the slide that I can discuss and describe, so at some point I have to cut or, or talk too fast, which is not very valuable. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs>